Good morning, everyone. We'll be starting momentarily, um, just waiting for a few more people to arrive. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth Ernest, and I am the Editor-in-Chief of Volume 20 of the First Amendment Law Review. And it is my great honor to welcome you all here today. I know we're all disappointed that we can't be together physically in Chapel Hill, but we've got a really great program planned for you today, and I hope you're all excited. To start us off, I would like to introduce Dean Martin Brinkley. Dean Brinkley is the head of our UNC School of Law and the William Rand Keenan Jr. Distinguished Professor. As a native North Carolinian, Dean Brinkley graduated from Harvard University and UNC School of Law. He clerked for Judge Sam Irvin in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit and worked in private law practice for 22 years. In 2015, he became the first person to lead the, our law school directly from practice. Dean Brinkley is also a passionate musician and has been known to serenade his students with a performance on the oboe, which I know they all enjoy. Dean Brinkley, we're so glad to have you here today. Welcome. Thank you, Elizabeth. And can you hear me okay? Great. Okay. Well, I apologize for being the delay in our start here. We had some technological difficulties getting me um, hooked in, but uh, I've been excited about being with you. <clears throat> As Elizabeth said, um, good morning. I'm, I'm Martin Brinkley. I'm the Dean of the Law School. I wish I could welcome you in person to the southern part of heaven on a beautiful uh, winter day featuring a Carolina blue sky. But today, uh, even if I could welcome you in person, it would only be to a gray, wintry, and for us, very cold uh, backdrop, more common to New England or uh, maybe at one of the Great Lakes states than to the sunny South. But we're very grateful to you for joining us uh, from wherever you are sitting, and we look forward to uh, extending our in-person hospitality to you at a later time. Ever since its establishment in 2002, the First Amendment Law Review has played an important role in the intellectual life of our law school. Previous iterations of today's symposium have taken up critical topics spawned by the rights and freedoms guaranteed by the First Amendment, such as religion in public schools, internet speech and its implications, ramifications of the Citizens United decision, a 25-year retrospective on Hazelwood School District v. Kuhlmeyer and student speech, a 50-year reflection on New York Times v. Sullivan and free speech in higher education. In its coverage of these path-breaking topics, the Fowler has brought luminaries from the academic, judicial, and journalistic worlds to Chapel Hill, William Van Alstyne, Floyd Abrams, Erwin Chemerinsky, and Judge Jeffrey Sutton of the Sixth Circuit, to name but a few. As we head into yet another election year, with the repercussions of the 2020 election still ringing in our ears, and the continuing efforts of the previous president and his supporters 
to obfuscate and disguise the truth about that election. The topic of today's symposium could have been lifted straight from the front pages of the New York Times. If the right to a say in the direction of their government is the most fundamental right all Americans possess, the freedom with which participants in and observers of the electoral process communicate their viewpoints and observations to the public and the responsibility they have to bear witness to factual truth must be front and center in our attentions. Moreover, examination of the role that purveyors of those views, viewpoints, news organizations, and other shapers of public opinion could not be more timely. Today, their cacophonous voices make a mockery of the marketplace of ideas, less now an agora of Athens ringing to the voices of Demosthenes and Lysias, or a United States Senate echoing to those of Clay and Webster, than a kind of mall of America with one unending food court after another, or worse, an Amazon.com, an endless array of choices presented as all equally valid. Pick what you choose, make it your own, and you will find validation. That seems to be our world. Has the doctrine that the answer to speech with which one disagrees is simply more speech going has, is it going to go the way of the corner five and dime? I congratulate Editor-in-Chief Elizabeth Ernst, some, the uh, other editors of Fowler and their colleagues on the work that has led up to what I hope will prove a scintillating few hours for each of you. Thank you again and welcome to UNC. Thank you so much, Dean Brinkley. We appreciate you being here. And with that, I will now turn it over to our symposium editor, Madeline Geis, who has worked incredibly hard to put on this program for you all today. Thanks, Elizabeth, and thank you again, Dean Brinkley, for getting us started. Um, we're really excited to have all of you here in this virtual world today. Um, we are going to start in just a few moments with our keynote address, which will be given to us by Commissioner Shauna Broussard from the FEC. Before we get started on that, I do want to mention for those of you who are um, seeking CLE credit for this event, um, I have emailed you a worksheet that you will need to fill out throughout the day um, with a few terms that you'll need to fill in for each of our panels, as well as for our keynote speakers address. Um, so the first word for that keynote speaker section uh, or the first term is going to be First Amendment. So you can go ahead and fill that in. I will pop in and out throughout the day um, and I will share more of those terms as we go on. Um, and if any of you have any questions throughout the day, those of you who are attendees should be able to see at the bottom of your screen, a Q and A box. Um, that's where you can put any questions. Our moderators and speakers will be able to see that section. Um, and there will be a time for question and answer at the end of each panel, as well as a few moments after Commissioner Broussard speaks. So Commissioner Broussard, with that, I will introduce you. Um, so Commissioner Broussard, on December 9th, 2020, um, Commissioner Broussard was confirmed by the United States Senate to serve as a commissioner at the Federal Election Commission. Commissioner Broussard is the agency's first African-American commissioner. In 2021, she served as the agency's chair. Commissioner Broussard joined the commission in 2008 as an attorney in the enforcement division of the Office of General Counsel. In 2015, she was assigned on detail as counsel for Commissioner Stephen T. Walther, advising the commissioner during his tenure as chair in 2017 and continuing in that role until her own appointment. Commissioner Broussard previously was an attorney advisor at the Internal Revenue Service, Office of Professional Responsibility and Deputy Disciplinary Counsel at the Louisiana Attorney Disciplinary Board. She also worked as a New Orleans Assistant District Attorney and was appointed in that role to the Violent Offenders Strike Force. An active member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Commissioner Broussard has focused on making a positive impact on the Northern Virginia community. She served as the second vice president of the Northern Virginia Alumni Chapter of the Sorority, chair of its health committee and co-chair of its risk management committee. From 2015 to 2018, Commissioner Broussard led Project Esther, the chapter's signature community service event dedicated to empowering women and children on their pathways out of homelessness, domestic violence, and sexual assault. 
Commissioner Broussard is from Louisiana and is a proud alumna of two historically black universities, earning her BA from Dillard University and her JD cum laude from Southern University Law Center. She is the recipient of the NAACP 2015 Juneteenth Celebration Trailblazer Award for Terrebonne Parish in recognition of her achievement as the first African American attorney from Ginson, Louisiana. Commissioner Broussard, thank you so much for being here today. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I do think that it is timely that we are all in different locations. Um, as the Dean said, I would have loved for the opportunity to be in that beautiful Southern weather. I am in Louisiana where we are um, considered to be very cold here. So um, it also works out that it's on, we're in a Zoom environment. So let's get started. So first, I want to say good morning to everyone. I want to thank the First Amendment Law Review for inviting me to be your keynote speaker at your symposium this year. It is an honor to participate in your symposium. Um, as the Dean mentioned, I will join in on that. I'm very disappointed that I could not be there in person with you. Um, I have never had a chance to visit your campus, so I was looking forward to visiting Chapel Hill, taking a stroll down Franklin Street, entering the Dean Dome. Uh, one of the attorneys who works for me, Jonathan Peterson, went to school at Carolina, and he definitely bleeds Carolina blue, much to our annoyance at times. So what exactly is the FEC, which I might refer to as times as the commission, and what role does it play in regulating money in politics? The commission was created through amendments to the Federal Election Campaign Act in 1974 in the aftermath of the Watergate political scandal, which involved secret illegal donations to the Nixon campaign. Congress recognized that a properly functioning democracy requires a well-informed public and that citizens should know how money is used to influence elections and that they should be armed with the knowledge that when they cast armed with that knowledge when they cast a vote in federal elections. I am one of six commissioners, all of whom are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. The commission has exclusive jurisdiction over the civil enforcement of federal campaign finance laws. As such, the FEC's responsibilities include, include excuse me, disclosing campaign finance information, enforcing provisions of the Federal Election Campaign Act, ICA, and overseeing the public funding of presidential elections. The commission may issue regulations, advisory opinions, policies and procedures, all for the guidance of compliance with the law. And we may find persons or entities for violations of the law. Now, I view the mission of the FEC as strengthening our democracy and protecting the integrity of the federal campaign finance process. One, by providing transparency to the public about money used in federal elections. And two, by fairly enforcing and administering our federal campaign finance laws. Indeed, transparency is perhaps the most important function of this agency. This year's symposium, Election Speech in the First Amendment, is taking place at an important moment in the nation's history. Campaign spending in the 2020 election cycle totaled nearly 14.4 billion, more than double the 6.5 billion spent in the 2016 cycle, making it by far the most expensive election ever. Nine of the 10 most expensive Senate races in history occurred in the 2020 cycle, as well as five of the 10 most expensive House races, and the other for history's sake occurred in 2018. And looking ahead at the 2022 midterm elections, I've seen projections of 9 billion on political spending alone, which is more than the total spending in the 2018 midterms. Now, I, while the numbers are so large, I don't think these extraordinary amounts should come as a surprise to anyone. The amount of money spent on federal elections has exploded over the last decade. At the same time, the spending has created enormous challenges in the regulation of campaign finance, particularly due to outdated laws and recent court cases. Beginning with Buckley v. Vallejo, the Supreme Court has emphasized that federal campaign finance laws implicate core speech protected by the First Amendment. Now, I'm always mindful of the unique relationship between the federal campaign finance laws and the First Amendment and the careful balancing act that must occur in matters that come before me as a commissioner. Since Buckley was decided 45 years ago, advances in technology have changed the way in which modern campaigns and other political actors engage in election-related activity. For instance, political advertising continues to shift from traditional sources, which should we even say it's traditional anymore, such as television and radio to texting and online, including through social media platforms and streaming services. As the symposium will explore, 
Political spending on social media platforms raises important First Amendment and federal campaign finance questions. Many of these questions appear campaign finance related on their face, but even ostensibly campaign finance questions may not necessarily fall within the jurisdiction of the FEC. The FEC's jurisdiction over campaign finance is sharply limited by our statutory authority. And there is an obvious disagreement at times over the FEC's authority, statutory authority, or whether the First Amendment protects certain activity from regulation. And then there are those times which we all agree that the agency lacks statutory authority to regulate certain activities. For instance, does the FEC have a role in regulating the practices of online social media platforms? And if so, what is it? Several matters that the commission recently closed originated with complaints against some of the largest social media companies, including Twitter and Facebook. The pervasive use and influence of these platforms, particularly as it involves politics and campaigns, is one of today's hot button issues. These, company, these companies' content moderation policies are a source of impassioned debates that often involve questions of whether they are too powerful and whether government intervention, including stricter laws, is important is appropriate. Some of the complaints that we considered allege that Twitter made prohibited corporate contributions to Joe Biden and his committee during the 2020 election cycle by suppressing negative information. For example, blocking users from tweeting links to certain news articles that Twitter determined contained false information. Some of the complaints were made by federal candidates whose own accounts were suspended or restricted based on what the platform may have viewed as inflammatory content. Other complaints still alleged that Facebook violated the act by fact-checking and limiting the distribution of posts by users linked to articles critical of Biden and Harris, including labeling some of those as false information. The commission though, unanimously concluded that there was no reason to believe that any campaign finance violations occurred. In disposing of the complaints in these matters, the commission concluded that the alleged actions did not result in contributions or expenditures under the act. In other words, the commission found that the actions of the social media companies were based on permissible business considerations and were not done for the purposes of influencing any federal election. And without any evidence of coordination or an electoral purpose, there was very little big debate among the commissioners regarding how to handle these matters. FICA does not, does not generally permit the agency to regulate an entity's business practices, even if they have the potential for election consequences. Now, as I mentioned earlier, campaign finance laws often tread in very sensitive areas involving the regulation of political speech. And the First Amendment is generally the touchstone that determines whether laws that we apply have crossed the line and infringe on constitutional rights. But Facebook and Twitter are not government entities that make or enforce such laws. They are for-profit corporations. But there seems to be some temptation to recast social media companies, particularly when they limit user access in response to the posting of controversial content, as quasi-government creatures trampling on the speech rights of the little guy. Now, no one would dispute that they are among our largest and most influential entities, but wearing my commissioner hat, I look to the area of law over which our agency has jurisdiction, and our laws do not regulate their content moderation choices. Now, there's one final point that I'd like to make here, given the topics of the symposium. Social media platforms content choices could be viewed as, viewed as analogous to newspapers exercising editorial control over the content they publish, which has long been recognized as a First Amendment protected right. Um, it looks like the screen went away for a second, but I'm gonna keep going. Um, does Twitter enjoy such a right? In declining to pursue uh, enforcement in these social media matters, my Republican colleagues wrote that, that Twitter and Facebook were acting as press entities and thus not subject to regulation under FICA. Now, FICA exempts any news story, com news story commentary or editorial distributed by a broadcasting station, newspaper, magazine, or periodical publication from the definition of an expenditure. So long as they are acting in their legitimate press function, their materials are available to the general public, and the subject activity is comparable in form to those of ordinarily issued by the entity. But the commission has long recognized that an entity otherwise eligible for the press exemption 
does not lose its eligibility, even if the activity in question lacks objectivity, it, or it advocates the election or defeat of a clearly identified candidate, or it's tailored to its users based on their preferences. The press exemption also applies equally to internet communications. The press exemption is grounded in the First Amendment. In enacting FICA, the legislative history indicates that Congress did not intend to limit or burden it in any way the First Amendment's freedom of press and of association, providing them the unfettered right to cover and comment on political campaigns. Now, my three colleagues explain that the press exemption applies to Twitter and similar social media companies because a sizable share, if not most of Americans, consume their news via Twitter and other social media platforms. These platforms allow the publishing and sharing of original content. Uh, they sell advertising and curate and summarize news stories, and they're available to the general public. They're also, they also explain that even if the press exemption did not apply to Twitter's content moderation policies, those policies were protected under the First Amendment. Three commissioners, including myself, concluded that determining whether the press exemption applies or whether Twitter and other social media companies enjoy the protections of the First Amendment is unnecessary, given the commission's precedent in similar matters, where we concluded that the respondents' actions were motivated by business considerations rather than efforts to influence the election. So there's a lot of information. So I invite anyone who is interested in looking into this or uh, wants to know about it, feel free to reach out to me. But you can also locate this on our website under legal resources and the enforcement tab. And it's a series of MERS. You can search by the names Twitter, Facebook, um, Twitter Analuda, Analuda, and Twitter Gates. But I want to say that despite our conclusion in these matters, social media company practices raise a number of other questions regarding their roles in our elections and democracy more generally, given the pervasiveness of online campaign activities. These questions include not only their content moderation policies, but also extend to the use of their platforms for micro-targeting of political ads, the spread of misinformation through their platforms, and whether they should receive immunity under 47 USC Section 230. Whether these companies should continue to enjoy Section 230 is a question for Congress but I will comment on the use of micro-targeting and the spread of false information in political ads. During the 2016 election cycle, the Russian Federation engaged in an extensive social media campaign that included the micro-targeting of political advertising as a means of spreading disinformation to large US audiences. These tactics were designed to sow discord in the US political system, undermine the 2016 election, and help Donald Trump win the presidency. None of this is in dispute. Social media, social media campaigns have been examined at length in official reports by the US intelligence community, congressional committees, and the special counsel at DOJ. Following the 2016 election, the commission has received a number of complaints alleging that the use of these and similar online tactics violate federal campaign finance laws. These tactics raise novel and complicated questions. Ordinarily, whether ads or issue ads or contain express advocacy generally determine whether they must be disclosed by non-political committees. Some cases it's clear, others not so much. This issue has been a source of wide disagreement among the commissioners. And there will certainly be a robust debate on whether to and to what extent misinformation and micro-targeting factors into this analysis. And does it matter whether these tactics are used by domestic or foreign actors? The Supreme Court recently issued a decision explaining that foreign individuals outside of the United States do not possess First Amendment rights. Uh, that's US Aid versus Alliance for Open Society International. Regardless of how the commission addresses these issues going forward, the use of these online tactics poses real challenges to election spending transparency. With respect to transparency, I firmly believe that the laws that promote transparency in election spending are all the more important given the Supreme Court's, Supreme Court's 2010 decision in Citizen United and the shift to online advertising. Uh, and I think there's something profound about the fact that you're having your event today, which is the anniversary, the 12th anniversary of this decision. It's hard to believe that this decision is 12 years old, um, but its effects cannot be overstated. Citizens United caused a fundamental shift in campaign finance law 
ushering in a new era of explosive campaign spending. As we all know, CEU and CEU, the court invalidated the FEC's ban on corporate and union spending on independent expenditures, and it overturned decades of court precedent. precedent. The court explained that the prohibition acted as a ban on free speech in violation of the First Amendment. But at the same time, the court linked this holding to another holding in the opinion in which eight justices reaffirmed the constitutionality of disclosure obligations. In the majority opinion, Justice Kennedy noted that the court's ruling would lead to a new campaign finance system that pairs corporate independent expenditures with effective disclosure. Transparency, the court explained, enables the electorate to make informed decisions and give proper weight to different speakers and messages. Now, perhaps this is the case in theory. The more important that you as a voter, the more information that you as a voter know about who is contributing to candidates on the ballot and in what amounts or what super PACs are running ads for or against those candidates, the more democracy is enhanced. That's how it should be. But in the aftermath of Citizens United, Justice Kennedy's prediction regarding effective disclosure has not come to fruition. A significant amount of the election-related spending is taking place in secret, especially on the internet. Massive amount of monies are flowing from wealthy donors and corporations to super PACs and other corporate entities masquerading as nonprofit social welfare groups, but are really political committees. The commission is frequently confronted with issues involving whether and to what extent corporate and union spending to influence elections should be disclosed, including whether a 501c4 group's political spending rises to such a level that they should be deemed a political committee under FECA. And commissioners have very different views about what the FEC can and should do on these issues. With the decisive shift to online political advertising post Citizens United and the use of micro targeting and misinformation tactics, effective disclosure is more important now than ever. Not only does micro targeting make it easier for misinformation to spread and for political spenders to sow further division in our country, but political spenders can do so by concealing who they really are and who funded their ad spending. By carrying out their social media campaigns in this matter, Voters are deprived of valuable information on who is seeking to influence them and why. And this prevents effective counter speech. Now, this is not to say that there value, there's no value to online political advertising. Indeed, the more speech in my view, the better as it contributes to a robust marketplace of ideas. And while there are a number of ways to combat micro-targeting and misinformation online, Effective transparency is one of the many tools that are available that could address the problems associated with misinformation and micro-targeting of political ads. This is why I believe the commission has to do more about enforcing the existing disclosure laws. At the same time, these laws must be strengthened to respond to online political advertising in a world of rapid technological change. For instance, Public communications that expressly advocate the election or defeat of federal candidates are subject to disclosure and disclaimer requirements. But the commission has been unable to agree on a rationale with respect to disclaimers for ads placed on social media platforms. Further, the commission's definition of public communications is outdated and it doesn't explicitly capture political spending on social media networks, media sharing networks such as YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn, streaming applications such as network and Hulu and other devices or applications. The commission has been considering rulemaking on internet communication disclaimers and revising the definition of public communication since 2011. The need for having these rules in place increases in tandem with the growing use of social media as a campaign tool. These rules would ensure that the millions of Americans who view campaign ads through their computers and personal devices have the necessary information to ascertain the source of these ads. Also, Congress should close the existing loopholes that allow political actors to run their ads online without having to disclose them to the commission, which is effectively concealing the source of the ads and the amount spent on them. The FECA requires disclosure of a certain category of communications called electioneering communications. Now you may know an electioneering communication is a broadcast on cable or satellite communication that clearly refers to a clearly identified federal candidate, is publicly distributed within 30 days of a primary or 60 days of a general election, and is targeted to the relevant electorate. Entities that run such communications must disclose them in filings with the FEC. 
but these requirements do not apply to online political ads. In other words, a group can spend millions of dollars spending funding political ads that feature federal candidates online without having to disclose them, even though they would have to do so if they ran the same ads on television. Proposed legislation such as the Honest Ads Act and HR1 would extend these reporting requirements to online ads. The legislation is necessary to ensure proper disclosure of political spending in our current political environment. To conclude, today's symposium will continue the important discourse concerning campaign finance, election spending online, and through social media and the First Amendment. These topics are not only timely, but they also involve some of the most pressing legal issues facing American democracy. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today about the work of the FEC, the challenges that we face in transparency in the context of election spending. And I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Broussard. Um, I would invite um, any attendees or other panelists again to use the Q&A function um, to pose any questions that you may have for Commissioner Broussard um, or to message me directly and I can ask them. I've got a few questions for you, Commissioner Broussard, that have been shared with me. Um, the first one is, um, you mentioned that the FEC is limited by its statutory power. What changes would you like to see to the FEC's authority? Well, <laughs> that would take a lot longer than I have here. But one of the first things I would do is that I think that there are not so much changes to the statutory authority, but I, I think we need to also work with the commissioners to, to kind of absolve and resolve some of the gaps that are already missing. Um, one of the things I mentioned is the internet disclaimers. Um, there's got to be an opportunity for the commissioners to get together and find a compromise to move forward on that. Resolving that in the definition of the public communication would help us in where, where political spending is moving forward, which is into the media in this online process. So I think the change of statutory authority, um, we could strengthen the laws a little bit in the sense of we only have the civil jurisdiction, the DOJ has the criminal jurisdiction. Uh, but what I would love to see is, is I would love to see some type of change to the existing laws that exist, like Citizens United. Changing that so that we can go back to our greater disclosure would be the first thing that could help um, with transparency. Thank you. Um, we have a question from <clears throat> Kendall Williams. Um, how do we determine what constitutes misinformation without being subjective? Oh, forgive me. This is the world of Zoom where things start beeping everywhere. Um, so would you repeat that for me, Madam? Yeah, how do we determine what constitutes misinformation without being subjective? Um, well, in the instance of the cases that we considered for Twitter, um, for Facebook, we left it to the media, to the media organizations for their own content moderation. So we have to remember that um, there's a balance that has to be struck for the FEC when it comes to the media exemption. Uh, something could be objective, it could be subjective, excuse me. And as long as there has a, a qualifying list of factors, it's going to be okay. Um, I think that's why we have to encourage more speech because more speech provides that more information which gives individuals or entities the opportunity to counter negative speech. Uh, maybe the answer is more speech. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a couple more questions. Um, do you think micro-targeting and specific social media algorithms could be regulated as speech by the social media entity themselves, not covered by Section 230? Yes, I, I do think it could be regulated by the entities themselves. I, I think that they've put some in place, but I think one of the things that needs to be taken care of in the sense of a congressional issue is the actions of foreign actors to be able to have access to these. And that's one of the provisions of HR1, which require uh, that you list the individuals that are making the purchase, that you can identify whether there's any foreign actors involved. Um, that is one of the obvious targets of uh, the issues of micro-targeting that we have seen. So I do think that we, at this stage, we can rely, let's, let's, let's pull it to air quote, rely on the social online organizations to moderate content. Um, but we do think that in 
increased regulations for HR1 would be a greater support for that. I think, I'm not saying. I want to circle back one thing, Madeline, you asked like statutory authority. And I guess the question just kind of threw me off for a second because there's so much um, that could be done. Um, there, I think one thing that the statutory authority we do need to look at is the foreign ballots, uh, like ballot initiative issues. Um, we recently had a case that we we dealt with that very issue. And one of the points is, is, is and there was a lot of controversy on the side because I voted with the Republicans on this side to find that there was no violation of the, of the act. Because while foreign nationals are prohibited from making contributions, there is nothing in the statutes that say that they are prohibited from ballot initiatives. But I clearly disagree with the idea that a foreign national should be involved in any process, whether it's issue advocacy or relates to campaign finance, like federal election. But without some specific actions by Congress, we can't resolve that point. So that could be one of those that I'm like, come on, come on in and do something about that. And there seems to have been some activity um, in the Senate in regards to that. Um, a question from Mason Butner. Uh, you mentioned that the commission found that social media companies did not engage in these activities for election related purposes. What actions would constitute election related activities from social media companies? <sighs> That's a, that's a hard question because they, they've had actual candidates. They could, it, it really gets down to the issue where, and, and we, we've tried very hard to keep this for business purposes as opposed to getting into the media exemption because expanding the media exemption to Twitter and Facebook, um, that's, if we talk about an explosion, that's an explosion right there. So election related, I'm, I'm gonna have to think on that one. I'd be happy to, to respond to it, to, to give you guys in writing something. Sounds good. Um, and a question from Luke Weiss. I apologize if I mispronounced that last name. Um, classifying misinformation is obviously difficult. Do you worry that the line differentiating misinformation versus unpopular opinions could be even more difficult with more authority? It's, it's an obvious worry. Oh, forgive me. Look, I'm, this is the world that we're in, the Zoom world. Um, I, I'd say yes, I, I am, I'm one of these people that I have to think on the question and then I come back. But one of the questions that you asked about the social media um, and whether, when it would step into election related content, it goes to the point that I mentioned that if there was coordination um, regard, regarding that or federal expending on a, on a candidate, but the main thing would be for the coordination. Uh. Um, we have another, um, how optimistic should we be about long-term lasting legislative answer, answers to things like the FEC's authority, or online campaign finance runarounds with a high court that seems to view campaign contributions as speech in its purest form. Sorry, I'm getting telephone calls left and right. And so I'm like, okay, let's at least let that ring. Um, so Madeline, do me one more time, read that question for me again. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, how optimistic should we be about long-term lasting legislative answers to things like the FEC's authority or online campaign finance runarounds with a high court that seems to view campaign contributions as speech in its purest form? Well, I, I'm one person that wants to lean toward optimism, but that's kind of, kind of hard when you have a court that is very conservative leaning um, and they've issued decisions that were Citizens United, McCutcheon, all of these that seem to be decreasing the, 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 the world of the FEC, where not obviously contributions remain safe. Um, the court has found that contributions cannot be touched, but the expenditures um, seem to be opening more and more and more. And it's just the factor that we are looking at a conservative court. And this is if what cannot be addressed in the court, hopefully the legislature could then, Congress could then come in and, and do some of these things. But it's, don't, 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 don't make me take away my optimism is what I'm saying is don't make me take that away. 
Um, I've got one last question. Um, so if anyone has other questions they want to put in the Q&A box, they are welcome to do that. Um, but oh, sorry, things are just moving. Uh, we might have some more. But do you think that the transition from traditional forms of media to the new forms you mentioned, such as text, social media, et cetera, has influenced transparency in campaign spending? Uh, for example, through requirements to disclose sponsor sponsorship in television ads. Do I think it's it's enhanced campaign? Uh, do you think that it has? Um, do you think that that transition from those traditional forms of media to more social media, things like that has influenced transparency in campaign spending, um, like how there are requirements to disclose sponsorship in TV ads. Well, there's disclaimer requirements on the TV ads and everything, but that's the, do I think it's influenced? Yes, because one of the problems is we don't have the same measures in place for internet disclaimers as we, or internet communications as we do for those traditional, as I say which I think it's time we almost stop calling it traditional because we're in a stage where everyone is on Hulu, Netflix. Um, I, I, if I did an online poll, how many people are on regular cable and get their newspaper every day? We probably do that online as well. So I, I do think that there, there, there is that, that the point that I mentioned. Yeah, definitely. Um, right, this is from Professor Ardia. Uh, the FEC was created in 1975, long before we had any notion of social media. Um, Professor Arnie is hoping that you can talk about whether the FEC, as it is currently structured and funded, is positioned to be able to regulate social media companies, um, assuming, assuming it's given broader authority to do so. Um, some commentators have proposed a new digital regulator for social media. Do you think that would be necessary or useful? Useful, yes. Um, I, I would like to see the expansion of the FEC's authority so that we'd be able to do these things. But um, until we have statutes that are in place that give us that authority, we cannot make regulations to that effect. And the regulations that we have, we still, I mentioned the conservative court, remember that this is a commission that's comprised of six, uh, six individuals and half are Republican. And right now we have two Democrats and an independent. And so you have to have four people to be able to come together to find something, which is why the internet disclaimers, despite being, uh, the rulemaking has been going on for 11 years or 10 years, excuse me. And we've had numerous hearings and numerous comments from the public that said it is a value to, to move forward on this. I, it, it's a challenge when you have an organization that's set up with this even number and with an equal split and you're forced to come together. But that's also by some considered to be the benefits of the agency is that it forces us to come together for compromise. And usually compromise is nothing. Usually no one likes compromise. The, 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 no one really likes the, the end result out of that. Uh, this is from Professor Martin Reddish. Uh, why do you assume an intersection between the fact that the court is conservative and the fact that it has been pro-free speech? Um, can't liberals favor pro-free speech decisions in this area? Yes, I can. I, I think it, it all, all depends on what side you view it. And I, just being subjective, view it in the side that the, the liberal, the conservative nature of the court has been more pro-speech, which I'm not against speech in any way, but the speech as it relates to the fundings and the expenditures that are being put into the political arena. I don't see any other questions, but I want to give a little bit of time if people are thinking of things to ask. Um, but perhaps if someone has a question later on, um, I can reach out to you via email. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner Broussard. Um, it was great to hear from you and to have you answer questions and be here today. We really appreciate it. Um, the next thing on our agenda for the day, oh, first of all, for those of you with your CLE worksheet, 
um, your second term for the day under keynote speaker is Chapel Hill. So the two terms you should have are First Amendment and Chapel Hill, and those should both be under keynote speaker. Um, up next, we will start our first panel, which will be moderated by Professor Papandrea. Um, we will begin that panel at 10.15. Um, so we will have a break for about 20 minutes right now. Um, this Zoom webinar will stay open. Um, you're welcome to step away, have your cameras off and be muted and come back at 10.15 um, as we get started on our first panel of the day. Thank you.
All right, it's 10.15, so we're going to get started on our first panel of the day, which is um, the um, regulation of the content of election-related speech. Um, moderating this panel for us today will be Professor Papandrea. Um, Professor Papandrea joined um, the Carolina Law Faculty in 2015 and currently serves as the Samuel Ash Distinguished Professor of Constitutional Law. Her teaching and research interests include constitutional law, media law, civil procedure, national security, and torts. Uh, Professor Papandrea attended Yale College and the University of Chicago Law School, where she served as the topics and comments editor of the Chicago Law Review and graduated with high honors. Um, after law school, Professor Papandrea clerked for Associate Justice David H. Souter of the United States Supreme Court as well as Judge Douglas Ginsburg of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and Judge John Keedle of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. She practiced law at Williams and Connolly LLP in Washington, D.C., and she taught at Boston College Law School prior to joining Carolina Law. Professor Papandrea served as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs from 2016 to 2021 and received the Charles E. Day Award for Excellence in Service in 2020. Thank you for being here, Professor Papandrea, and I will let you take it from here. Great. Thank you so much, Maddie, for that introduction. Thank you to the audience members for joining us on this cold day, at least down here. Um, thank you for Commissioner Broussard for really setting up some of the big issues that we are going to be dissecting today. Um, I have the honor of leading the first of three all-star panels, truly. I know some of you students may not fully appreciate how lucky you are to be hearing from these incredible scholars from all over the country. Um, and so the first panel today is going to be discussing the regulation of the content of election related speech. So um, I'm sure you all can imagine that a lot of concerns about misinformation, disinformation in the election context. So this panel is going to be diving into that topic with five incredible people. We have an hour and a half. Each person is going to present for 10 minutes, and, um, and then we're going to have a discussion among ourselves, um, and then we'll take your questions. I encourage you to write down and enter your questions in the Q&A as we go. You don't need to wait. Um, I will not ask your questions until uh, we get into more of a discussion in Q&A period, but um, please write them as we go so you don't forget them. I'm really looking forward to getting your um, engagement in this um, in this symposium. So we're going to go in alphabetical order by last name, um, starting with uh, Professor Clay Calvert. I will introduce the professors right before they speak rather than doing five introductions right now, just so we can get going. I know I'm excited. To, to start hearing the speaker. So um, with that, let me introduce my dear friend, Clay Calvert, a frequent attendee at these symposiums because he always brings so much energy and incitement, uh, excitement and incitement. Incitement um, too, incitement. <laughs> Um, to uh, to these uh, to any topic that we um, that we address. In fact, I saw in his bio he has written over 150 articles on uh, on First Amendment issues. In fact, whenever I think about writing an article, it's a good bet that Clay has already written that article that I was thinking about. Um, Clay is the prof a professor of law, the Breckner Eminent Scholar in Mass Communication and Director of the Marion B. Breckner First Amendment Project at the University of Florida in Gainesville. He joined, uh, holds a joint appointment with the School of Law at the University of Florida and the College of Journalism and Communications, which means that he's teaching both undergraduates and law students, and he coordinates the joint JDMA and JD PhD programs for the College of Journalism and Communications. Um, no surprise to me, he was named um, just recently in April 2021, the University of Florida's Teacher Scholar of the Year. So no pressure there, Teacher Scholar of the Year. Please enlighten us. Um, uh, Clay, let's, uh, let's hear from you now. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Mary Rose. And thank you, Maddie, for organizing this. It's an excellent symposium. As Mary Rose said, it's a distinguished group of people. And, and that does not include me, no matter what she says. So uh, I thought since I am the uh, have the honor, I guess, or the dubious honor of being the first speaker here, I would kind of tee this up at a high level when we're talking about 
the regulation of content of election related speech. And maybe the first thing we should think about at a high level is really what do we mean by election speech? Uh, I was kind of thinking about Alexander Mickeljohn and his initial theory about political speech. And eventually he kind of had to backslide on what do we mean by speech that affects the voting of wise decisions. So when we talk about regulating election speech or election related speech, I think we might have an issue initially of definitional. What, what are we gonna talk about here? So I think that's one issue at the higher level. What are we talking about when we mean election speech? The second thing I think is what is it that we fear? Uh, I think this is a big thing we have to go back to. We go back to our uh, Brandeis quote, of course, right, from Whitney versus California that uh, men feared witches and burnt women. Uh, what is it that we fear about false speech, disinformation, or misinformation? I guess the difference being whether there's intent to mislead or not an intent to mislead on disinformation versus misinformation. But what is it that we really fear here? Why do we want government regulation in this space in the first place? And then if we take that down to the next level that we fear some type of harm, I think then we have to get back to what the United States Supreme Court has suggested in content-based regulations of speech in both Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association, that's the violent video game case, and the Alvarez case, the, the Stolen Valor case, is that you actually have to prove a direct causal link. And they use that term uh, in both of those cases. And most significantly, I think for false speech, the Alvarez case, a direct causal link between the speech in question and the harm to be ameliorated. And so we can speculate uh, that putting in place some of the things people have talked about, and we can get into them in more detail, might actually succeed uh, in reducing harms, whatever those harms are. So we've got to go back to that. What is it we fear? Once we identify it, then can we really prove a direct causal link then between the remedy that we're seeking to impose on it and then uh, that the harm is going to be uh, reduced or mitigated from it? Uh, the next big high-level point that I think... Uh, should come in here is we're really dealing with two possible types of content-based regulations. Uh, one might be restricting speech on the one hand, and the other would be compelling speech on the other. So are we going to go down that road if we want to restrict and regulate speech, uh, prevent it from coming out, uh, or are we going to compel speech? Uh, and this gets into the questions about transparency. Uh, on the parts of the social media platforms in how they prioritize speech uh, and also their terms of service or terms of use. Uh, so that's another level that we could think about maybe today. Are we going to go down that road of compelling speech or restricting speech and, and strict scrutiny being the standard uh, that we would think about? Obviously, in election funding speech, we might have exacting scrutiny, uh, which is pretty close to uh, strict scrutiny uh, in the monetary space for compelling release of data on that, uh, but we still have that. The other kind of one I think is really interesting here is maybe going back and reflecting back on a case the students probably uh, have read, which is Miami Herald versus Tornillo, uh, which I think is going to be a big case uh, in some of the cases that are coming up. For instance, here in Florida, we have the Net Choice versus Moody anti deplatforming case. Uh, and that's going to be a question of, I think, access and the relevance of Tornillo, which was 1974. Uh, today, coming up nearly 50 years later, uh, Tornillo is really can be viewed as two things. One, editorial interference, uh, and but that dealt with a newspaper. Uh, and the court specifically in Tornillo refers to the press clause. Is that going to be different? And the court's going to treat that differently than editorial interference uh, with social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, which ostensibly uh, are really not members of the press as we would traditionally think of as members of the press. Yet they certainly are protected by the First Amendment as speech providers, and they certainly engage in editorial control and discretion when they post their own terms of use and service and say this type of content is or is not objectionable. So I think going back in terms of this, we're also going to get back into the access theory a little bit, uh, digging back to Barron and Fiss, uh, and whether or not, uh, and what's happening here in Florida, just briefly, uh, the law in question has been enjoined. It was enjoined at the end of June. Uh, by Judge Hinkle. What the law in question does is it prohibits the deplatforming of candidates for state and local office uh, by social media platforms and state and local office here in Florida only. Uh, by social media platforms that have more than 100 million uh, users or $100 million of revenue that they generate. 
Uh, so it only applies to the very large platforms, which of course raises under inclusivity problems uh, in terms of the tailoring facet of that law. And conveniently enough, and I think Mary Rose and I talked about this at some point uh, in New York at PLI, Florida conveniently uh, eliminated from this or carved out an exception uh, for social media platforms that uh, own a theme park uh, in, uh, in Florida, which is a great convenient exception to this, right? Uh, talk about vast under inclusivity issues and a little bit of Homerism, right? Uh, favoring the home state of Florida, which is pretty much one of the things uh, uh, we're known for besides uh, hurricanes. So I think the access theory, we're gonna see some new reliance put on that. I expect to see Florida, this by the way, since it was enjoined at the end of June is now before the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Tons of amicus briefs have been filed in this case. Uh, I think we're gonna see Florida trying to make that argument that the people of Florida have a right to receive information. Uh, uh, a right to know uh, about candidates for public office. Uh, so it's really going to be a wedge issue. And I think the relevance of Tornillo uh, is going to be important in that case. The other case that's coming up, uh, as you know, is also in Texas. It's another net choice versus Paxton case uh, that prohibits viewpoint based discrimination by social media platforms. There, the uh, number of subscribers uh, is reduced to 50 million, but still a very high level. Uh, and that has also been enjoined. That was enjoined uh, by Judge Pittman uh, on December 1. And that obviously will go up then to the Fifth Circuit. Uh, so I think at the high level, we need to think about those things just to kind of summarize, you know, uh, to go back. One, what do we mean by election related speech? Two, what is it that we fear? Three, can we really prove a direct causal link between any remedies that we might have uh, or not? Uh, four, then going into the differences between do we want to compel speech? transparency, or are we going to restrict speech? And then going to the case of Tornillo, which I think is going to be really important in these decisions and its relevance, uh, and, and whether or not we say that the editorial control and choice of newspapers is different from that of social media platforms, whether the, uh, Tornillo was a press clause case or not. The other interesting thing is Tornillo uh, by its terms, never really uses the term strict scrutiny, does it? Uh, it doesn't. And I think that's one of the questions too, is it says there's absolute protection or immunity for editorial control uh, because they never really get to a strict scrutiny analysis on the tailoring part. They basically suggest that editing is for editors, whether it's fair or not fair. Uh, so that's, that's my stake uh, to kind of tee it off with some high level uh, principles and issues we might consider today. Well, thank you so much, Clay. That was that was really great. And you know, students, I um, encourage you any of your questions, but particularly if you have questions about these recent decisions that uh, that Professor Calvert just mentioned in Florida and Texas, um, you may have some questions about how those worked and how the doctrine might play out. And I know our teacher scholar of the year here would be grateful. Uh, we're very happy to answer those questions. All right. Speaking of amazing teachers and scholars, next up is going to be. Bill Marshall, one of my personal role models. Um, I want to be just like Bill. Uh, Bill joined the Carolina Law Faculty in 2001 and serves as the William R. Keenan Jr. Distinguished Professor of Law. His teaching and research interests are very broad um, and cover the First Amendment, presidential power, election law, federal jurisdiction, federal judicial selection, civil procedure, and media law. He has written many book chapters, articles, and essays on free speech, separation of powers, the establishment clause, the free exercise clause, and published in any fancy journal you can name, he has published in it. Um, uh, he received his law degree from Chicago and his undergraduate degree from UPenn. He served as deputy counsel to the president and deputy assistant to the president during the Clinton administration and also served as the Solicitor General for the state of Ohio. He has taught at a number of other law schools, but fortunately he's right here at UNC. And uh, we're so glad to have you here today, Bill. Um, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Rhodes. I think what I'd like, first of all, is to have you introduce me every time I speak anywhere because, because the exaggerations that you give are really, are really terrific. Um, thanks to, thank you, Maddie. Thanks for doing all the work that you've done to put this together. And let me thank my, uh, my, my um, fellow panelists, Clay, who actually are quite distinguished. Marty is, is one of the great professors in federal courts and free speech. Helen knows more about the issues of truth and falsity in, in, uh, 
in, in the First Amendment law than I think anybody in the country. And Evan, my former student, so great to see you. So great to see you on the panel as well. So I'm excited to, to have a discussion among, among, among this group uh, because it is a terrific group. I'm kind of also gonna give a little bit of an introductory part to talk a little bit about some of the underlying issues that involve the regulation of campaign content. And I'm thinking specifically of the issues of, uh, involving the regulation of false campaign speech. And I've written a couple of things on this in which I've tried to identify the underlying issues on both sides. So I wanna do that to sort of start us off, uh, conclude a little bit about the constitutionality and then end up with a little bit of talking about the policy and how the regulation of false campaign speech might work in the world that we have today that is so polarized. Okay, so what are the reasons in favor of regulating false campaign speech? Well, one is false campaign speech can distort the electoral process. If a candidate is pro-gun rights and pro-abortion rights, and their opponent characterizes them as anti-gun rights and anti-abortion rights, if that candidate wins, if the candidate who lies wins, then maybe it's not reflecting what the voters really want because they've been misled as to what they're gonna get with their particular candidate. So one thing it can obviously do is distort the results because we, because we as the voters may not know what people actually stand for if there's so many lies in the campaign. A second reason for regulation is debasement. Lies debase the quality of discourse. Now, uh, I'm gonna get back to this later. This has been true since the first elections, but lies, lies debase um, the rhetoric and the discourse that we use to go through the political process. Relatedly, they foster cynicism. When we hear constant lies about particular candidates, the voters are become more cynical, they become more alienated, and that either discourages participation or removes our belief that our votes actually make a difference. They also obviously can harm the reputations of the particular candidates. People ask my class this all, all the time. Many people are discouraged from entering into the political process because they believe that lies about them will never be rectified or can be rectified. A, a specific issue also, another reason might be that certain kinds of false information could lead to voter suppression. We've seen examples of this in which in which uh, it has been announced, for example, that there are so many people voting this year. This is a real example. There are so many people voting this year that we've made it so that Republicans are gonna vote on Tuesdays and Democrats are gonna vote on Wednesday. And that is announced as, as, as what's going on. And obviously that can suppress the particular votes. And finally, finally, one of the reasons why we might wanna regulate false campaign speeches is the value of truth, that we want truth uh, a truth is a value of our democracy, and we want to have enactments that protect that particular value. Okay, those are the arguments on one side. What are the arguments on the other side? Well, one is maybe the value of truth in, in elections is overly exaggerated. Candidates think, I mean, sorry, voters think that candidates lie all the time. So they're expecting this, and maybe they're not as influenced by lies as much as, as, much as we might think. Um, Secondly, campaign discourse is necessarily volatile. Uh, to put that, put that kind of scrutiny behind a give and take that is necessarily gonna be filled with hyperbole and exaggerations may be problematic because it might still the, the, um, the energy in a particular race. Um, third, the process takes too long. If you're trying to correct what voters' impressions are of candidates, by the time the litigation is completed with respect to whether or not, whether something a candidate said is true or false, the election has been long gone. Um, fourth, the process can be and is often weaponized. The attack that somebody has lied is itself a campaign tactic. And we need to have, if we're gonna have laws prohibiting candidate lying, then we also probably should have something which limits the ability of other candidates to bring false claims that a candidate has lied. 
And finally, and, and, and I know this is something that Marty has particularly cared about and written about, just, just the problem of government overseeing what is truth. Um, Justice Kennedy, not that I ever want to put Marty Reddish and Justice Kennedy in the same sentence, but he talked about that in the Orwellian approach in, uh, in, in when he talked about Alvarez, that we don't want a government as to what is true, uh, deciding what is true and what is false. So in my earlier articles, I, I kind of left it a little bit vague as to whether or not it would be constitutional or not. I do think, and Rick Hassan has written on this as well, I do think certain kinds of false campaign speech can be regulated without much difficulty. For example, claims that I identified before, giving misinformation about voting times, voting dates, et cetera. It may also be true that, that uh, maybe false campaign speech, false campaign speech when somebody represents themselves as being a judge or something like that might also be sanctionable. Um, other kinds of issues that I identified before, a claim that, sex, that uh, candidate A supports gun rights when that candidate doesn't, I think that's a little bit, a little bit harder to uh, prevail on that, particularly after Alvarez. So I do think that the constitutional playing field and Alvarez has clearly made this kind of regulation much harder. Um, but the last question I want to ask before I turn it over is a separate question, different from the constitutionality, which is, is this a good thing for regulation? Should we do this? If we were told that, that we absolutely could regulate false campaign speech, is it a good idea? I used to think it was more than I do now, because I do think that the value of truth uh, and not just getting truth in campaign speech, but also having laws that represent the value of truth are, are, are incredibly value itself. I think Alvarez is problematic in that just the message saying it's okay to lie under the First Amendment may be true as a legal matter, but it's a bad normative statement. Um, but now I, I feel a little bit differently because I'm concerned in this polarized society, it wouldn't make a difference. It doesn't, uh, First of all, you know, I, when I teach First Amendment, I started off by citing Abrams and saying truth and falsity are going to are going to fight it out and truth is going to win. And I asked my students, and Evan can tell you this is true, how's that working out? It isn't. And one of the reasons it isn't is because this marketplace of ideas suggests that voters want truth, and there's pretty good indication they don't. There's a pretty good indication that much of the electorate isn't really interested in this product. So why regulate in favor of it if that's not what the public itself wants? Second, candidates don't think that they are bound by truth. Um, and I think what that leads to is the suggestion that this isn't the normative value that we're seeing in the political process. So a sanction against a candidate for lying or the threat of lying wouldn't seem to have that much of a deterrent effect. Third, as I indicated before, claims can be weaponized. And fourth, and this goes back to one of the basic principles is that, can we really expect there to be neutral arbiters in a polarized world? And one of the most disturbing things about redistricting cases, for example, is the first question that's asked is who are the judges? because we know Republicans are gonna go one way and Democrats are gonna go another way most of the time. That would be the first question that is asked in a case dealing with the litigation of truth and falsity. That's a problem. So that's my introductory comments. I'm looking forward to hear what everybody else has to say. Wow, that, that was great, Bill. Thank you so much. We have so much to talk about, uh, but we still have three more presentations. And next up, continuing, the lineup of rock star professors. We have Helen Norton, who is the University Distinguished Professor and Roth Gerber Chair in Constitutional Law at the University of Colorado School of Law, where her scholarly and teaching interests include constitutional law and civil rights law. Before she became a professor, Professor Norton served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the US Department of Justice and as Director of Legal and Public Policy at the National Partnership for Women and Families. She currently serves as Special Counsel on Constitutional and Civil Rights for Colorado's Attorney General. Um, she recently published an amazing book called The Government Speech and the Constitution, and her work on the First Amendment issues 
has also appeared in lots of fancy journals. I won't list them all. Um, I have long admired Helen's work, as she knows. Uh, we've had many conversations about government speech, but she is, as Bill noted, uh, one of the, if not lead scholars on truth and falsity, particularly coming from the government, but not, you know, government officials of all kinds. So we're very honored to have you here, Helen, um, today to offer some of your thoughts on this topic. Thanks so much, Mary Rose, for that characteristically gracious introduction. And thanks too to Madeline and the whole team at the First Amendment Law Review for all your great work in putting this together. It's really a pleasure to be part of this discussion. Like Bill, I'm gonna talk mostly about the regulation of election related lies. And then I'm gonna close with just a bit about election related threats. So starting with lies, uh, as Clay mentioned, United States versus Alvarez involved a First Amendment challenge to a federal law that criminalized intentional lies about receiving certain military honors. And even though the liar's lawyer conceded that the law neither punished nor chilled any valuable speech, the Supreme Court emphasized its concerns about the government's potential for regulatory abuse when it held that the act violated the First Amendment. So in other words, the court focused not on whether and when lies or other forms of speech are or aren't valuable, Instead, it focused on whether and when the government is too often scary and dangerous, especially in regulatory contexts where the government may be self-interested, biased or clumsy, the polarization and bias concerns that Bill closed his remarks with. So any effort to regulate election related lies consistent with the First Amendment has got to address these sorts of concerns, these legitimate concerns about the government's potential enforcement overreach. Now, there's no majority opinion in Alvarez. Instead, we have three different opinions uh, in which, however, all nine justices nevertheless agreed that the First Amendment does permit the government to punish lies that inflict sufficient harm. What the justices didn't do, however, is offer any clear or majority guidance about what constitutes sufficient harm. So this requires us to think hard about harm. Lies can inflict harms that are more or less tangible, that are individualized or collective, and where the causal connection between speech and harm may be more or less complex or attenuated. So once we recognize the variety and the complexity of harms threatened by lies, we can see that the traditional regulatory tendency to focus on lies that inflict tangible and individualized harm like financial or reputational harm, it's not because other lies don't threaten significant harm. Instead, it's because the challenges of proving less tangible harm or collective harm or sufficient causal connection between the lie and the harm trigger our concerns about the government's overreaching, its self-interest, its bias, maybe its incompetence. So in other words, the less tangible or the more diffuse or causally complicated the harm, the less we may trust the government's decisions about whether and when to find harm. So the challenge for regulatory interventions with respect to election related lies is figuring out how to accurately capture harm significant harm in a way that offers, that also offers limiting principles to address legitimate concerns about government abuse. This is a, a tough nut to crack and understandably so, but it's not a null set. Interestingly, for example, all nine justices in Alvarez endorsed the constitutionality of laws that broadly prohibit lies to the government. And I think about these as, as lies to manipulate public power. And all nine justices also endorse the constitutionality of laws that prohibit speakers from falsely representing themselves to be government officials. And I think about these as lies to misappropriate public power. And they endorse the constitutionality of these laws even though these lies often inflict harms that don't involve financial or reputational or other harms traditionally thought tangible or measurable. And I think this provides some clues, some guidance to the constitutional regulation of election lies even while it also poses some puzzles. So here's a little more detail. First, the justices endorsed the constitutionality of a wide variety of laws that forbid us from lying to the government. Now for sure, some of these lies are told to obtain a tangible gain like a government contract, but many don't seek such traditionally tangible benefits, yet they're still prohibited because they seek to influence the government's decision-making, for example, by diverting law enforcement officials' investigative resources. The regulable harm, according to the court, is that the manipulation of the government's decisions, that is, is the manipulation of the government's decisions about how to spend its time and its personnel resources. 
Second, all nine justices also endorsed the constitutionality of the many laws that prohibit a speaker from falsely representing herself to be a government official like a, like a police officer, but not only a police officer. We can think about these as lies about being the government. In other words, as a type of lie about the source of speech, a lie about who's talking to you. And here too, these sorts of lies are often told to obtain a tangible benefit for the liar, maybe extorting money from vulnerable targets. But courts have also recognized less traditional understandings of harm in this setting by interpreting these laws to prohibit lies to influence the listener to change her course of conduct, to affect her decision-making in demonstrable ways. So for example, the court has held that a speaker's lie that he was a law enforcement officer told to convince his listener to share information that she was otherwise unwilling to share, that this was a prohibited lie about being the government because it sought to cause the target to change her course of conduct here to speak when she preferred not to speak. So what might this mean for the regulation of election related lies? This might help us think about these issues on a continuum of first amendment difficulty with the regulation of certain election related lies at one end of the continuum posing less constitutional difficulty when they address lies that have a fairly direct causal connection to harms that include changing listeners' course of conduct. And as we move down the continuum towards greater First Amendment difficulty, we see this when we start to target lies that threaten more diffuse or intangible harms or involve greater causal complexity. So with this in mind, I'll talk about two election-related settings at the end of the continuum where the government's interventions pose little First Amendment risk, and then I'll turn to a setting that has more First Amendment risk. So first, consider lies and misrepresentations about voting requirements and procedures, to quote the court's recent dictum in Minnesota versus Mansky. Now to be sure, we can anticipate litigation over how broadly or narrowly to define these lies about voting requirements and procedures. At a minimum, it should include not only lies about when and where and how to vote, like lies about the location of polls or the times at which the polls close, lies that you can avoid long lines and by voting by text, they also should include lies about who's eligible to vote, like lies that you can't vote if you've been arrested or lies that you can only vote in one election per year. These are lies about objectively verifiable facts that inflict harm by among other things, seeking to change certain listeners course of conduct by preventing them from voting. A second setting are various types about the lies, uh, uh, types of lies about the source of speech. In other words, election related lies about the identity of the speaker, about who's actually talking to you. So here's an example from the 2016 election documented by uh, Professor Spencer Overton. Fake Facebook pages targeted African-American users and falsely claimed to be authored by two black men, fa fa uh, falsely claimed to be authored by two black men who were saying, quote, we don't have any other choice this time, but to boycott the election. No one represents black people, don't vote, end quote. Now the content of the speech is not a lie. It states a political opinion. The lie is instead about the source of speech when it falsely claimed to be the speech of two black men. Now these election related lies about the source of speech often seek to change the listener's course of conduct. Although again, these harms are not tangible in monetary or other traditional senses. Yet the court has long upheld laws that require the accurate identification of the source of political contributions, the source of campaign advertisements, recognizing that accurate information about the source of speech can influence listeners' course of conduct, in other words, their choices in important ways. Commissioner Broussard uh, mentioned related issues as well in her keynote. Now here too, we can anticipate litigation over how broadly or narrowly to define election-related lies about the source of speech. I think they should also include a speaker's lie that she's the incumbent when she's not. Maybe also the speaker's lies about who's endorsed her candidacy. I think it's possible we could understand those as a type of lie about the speaker's identity. I'm gonna wrap things up by shifting gears. What about lies about the outcomes of elections? Lies about the incidents of election fraud? Now, sometimes these lies are actionable as defamatory if they're falsely describing the behavior of identifiable persons or entities in a way that inflicts reputational harm, for example, defamatory lies about the behavior of election officials or that voting machines are rigged. And such lies, if they're told by lawyers in litigation, can also trigger ethics and litigation sanctions. 
but other lies about election fraud may not inflict individualized harm, even though they certainly inflict collective harm to election integrity, to our democratic self-governance. Bill talked about some of these collective harms. But these harms may strike us as more diffuse, more causally complicated in terms of the link between these lies and listeners' course of conduct, such that we may worry about the government's potential for abuse if, we're, if it were to enforce laws prohibiting such lies, especially in times of polarization, as Bill noted. So in other words, restricting these types of lies pushes us further down the continuum of greater First Amendment difficulty. These sorts of lies about election fraud sometimes, however, incite illegal activity. Sometimes they inspire threats, threats specifically against election officials for following the law and doing their job. True threats are unprotected by the First Amendment and true threats include at a minimum speech where the speaker intends to make the target fear for their safety. So this means that in existing anti-threats laws or enacting new anti-threats laws specifically prohibiting threats against election officials should, know, should pose no First Amendment problem. And as a doctrinal matter, some un unanswered questions remain. For example, whether unprotected true threats should also include speech that a reasonable listener would understand to threaten their physical safety, regardless of the speaker's intent. And I see great value in taking that sort of listener-centered approach to true threats, in recognizing how these threats in the election context impose both individualized and collective harm by deterring election officials from doing their jobs. I look forward to listening to and learning from all of you. Oh, Helen, thoughtful as usual. I really appreciated that and look forward to discussing some of the ideas that you raised in, um, in, in our Q&A session. Um, next, we have one of the nation's leading First Amendment scholars, uh, Professor Marty Reddish. Marty Reddish is the Lewis and Harriet Ansel Professor of Law and Public Policy at Northwestern. And he teaches and writes on subjects uh, relating to federal jurisdiction, civil procedure, the freedom of expression and constitutional law. He received his AB with highest honors in political science from the University of Pennsylvania and his JD magna cum laude from Harvard. After graduation, he served as a law clerk to Honorable Joseph Smith of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Now here are some numbers to back up how impressive and how influential Professor Reddish has been in his scholarly work. Um, he has authored or co-authored more than 100 articles and 17 books, books. He has been consistently ranked among the 25 most cited legal scholars of all time in studies conducted by um, Hine and company and was included in a list of the top 20 legal scholars for impact on judicial decision-making in a 2016 study conducted by St. Thomas University Law School. So we're very grateful to have Professor Reddish with you and we look forward to hearing what you have to say on this subject. Thank you so much, Mary Rose. And Maddie, thank you for inviting me and putting this together. Uh, it is so great to virtually meet people who I've heard of and whose work I've read, but never had the chance to meet personally. But uh, it's especially nice to get to see Bill Marshall. Uh, Bill and I go way back. Uh, Bill, I, till, I still tell people the uh, story about our unpleasant run-in with Tony La Russa at the Sox game. <laughs> um, my topic on its face does not really fit this panel. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that uh, sub rosa or indirectly it does. Uh, I title this talk, A Liberal's Defense of Citizens United. And the commissioner just, just per perfectly teed it up for me by assuming, and, and she's not alone in this, an intersection between conservative philosophy and pro-freedom of speech. Well, isn't that interesting? Usually throughout history, the conservatives are the ones who have been against protecting speech. And it's the liberals who are for the ones for protecting speech. Why is this different? Well, I don't wanna put words in the mouth of the commissioner, so let me now take it more, more generally. Are, are we suggesting here that 
conservatives are protecting free speech rights here because they want to advance strategic political uh, ideologies. If we're doing that, then the liberal opposition is generally meaning the same thing. Now, uh, my credentials as a political liberal, I think, are clear. Uh, I was the Democratic precinct captain on the North Shore of Chicago for three years. The only reason I quit is they wouldn't uh, uh, promote me to precinct colonel. Uh, the only Republican I've ever voted for was the governor of Illinois, who then was sent to jail. Uh, in other states, they cheer for their governors four more years. In Illinois, we cheer three to five with time off for good behavior. Um, but so I, I yield to no one in my political uh, credibility as, as, a, as a liberal. Why that means I should oppose a pro-free speech decision, I don't understand. Uh, let's, let's sort of review the bidding here. What are the liberal scholars, and as far as I know, I'm the only liberal constitutional scholar who thinks Citizens United was correctly decided. If there's anybody else out there, I'd, I'd love to meet a, a, a kindred soul. What are the purported legitimate principled arguments uh, against Citizens United? Well, the first one I always hear, oh my God, it's a corporation. It's not a person, as if the First Amendment applies only to persons. But to me, this is reminiscent of Captain Renault in Casablanca saying he was shocked, shocked to find out gambling is going on at Rick's Cafe. And if you haven't seen the movie, go see it. Uh, what, what hypocrisy that to, to say a corporation sh shouldn't have a constitutional right. Uh, they are, uh, they have rights under the Sixth Amendment. They have rights under the Seventh Amendment. They uh, are protected by the Dormant Commerce Clause. They are, are protected by the Diversity Clause. And all of a sudden we're shocked the whole commercial speech doctrine is protecting corporations. And that's been going on since the 19, mid 1970s. Um, you know what's else a corporation? The New York Times, the Washington Post, at least aspirationally, they are profit-making corporations and they are powerful profit-making corporations, but somehow they're excluded. They're excluded, people tell me, because it's freedom of the press. And I say, oh yes, of course, freedom of the press, which distinguishes Citizens United, how? Is there, is there some originalist argument that cor big time corporations were allowed to, uh, were protected by the press clause? And how are we defining press? What if General Electric issues a, a monthly newsletter with articles of opinion. Is that the press? Or are we saying the freedom of the press is just one big antitrust violation? That it protects the institutional press and nobody can compete with it. When I watch Rachel Maddow, who I just love, except for the one area where she rails against Citizens United, and I, and I scream at the television, Rachel, why are you where you are? Why are you being paid millions of dollars to do what, what you do? Because Comcast, one of the biggest corporations in the country, is paying you to do it. And if they disagreed with what you're saying, you better bet you'd be out of there so fast your head would spin. So you are benefiting from the same corporate structure, this evil corporate structure that you're attacking. Think of the arrogance, think of the hypocrisy. And finally, think about the greatest free speech philosopher of all time that I like to cite in these situations. Clint Eastwood as Dirty Harry when he said, feel lucky, punk. Oh, it's great to, if you're in power, 
to shut up corporations because you assume they're going to say things you don't like that are against your political interests. Did you see the story a couple of months ago? And it was about North Carolina, as I recall, where um, the Coca-Cola Corporation issued a statement opposing the Georgia Voting Rights Act. And some county in North Carolina, sort of a gang that couldn't shoot straight, wanted to punish them for that. So they got rid of all the Coke machines in all the government offices. And it turned out they were just hurting some local business that they hadn't realized. And they, they changed their policy. Think about it. If you get rid of Citizens United, oh, corporations don't have First Amendment rights. They're not speakers. What if a state, Georgia, Florida, whatever, passes a law saying any corporation that issues a statement against the following positions, fill in the blanks, will be, will be taxed, a special penalty tax, uh, or corporations that say things that agree with the following positions will be given a special tax break. Can anyone imagine a more outrageous kind of viewpoint regulation, something that more distorts the whole structure of the democratic system that Alexander Micklejohn wrapped his, his, his arms around? But if they don't have First Amendment rights, they can't challenge the constitutionality of it. So it's, it seems to me to sort of sum up that what's been driving this, the, the liberal scholars comparison of Citizens United to Dred Scott for Pete's sake is deep down a kind of hostility, hostility to a polit particular political position or that they assume will come from corporations or simply they want to stop powerful speakers, except the ones that they maybe like, like the New York Times or the Washington Post. Um, I have in, in, in I think an article in the New Republic referred to me as a liberal Democrat with a pronounced contrarian streak. And I will accept that as my scholarly epitaph. But I ask you to, and maybe this applies to you. You ever learn when you, when you skid on ice, the worst thing you can do is turn away from the skid. That's your instinct to turn away from the skid. But what you have to do is overcome your, your immediate intuitive response and turn into the skid. And that's the way to avoid the problem. I'm asking you to turn into the skid to avoid the or circumvent the kind of typical in, intuitive reactions you've had to the idea that a corporation might have a First Amendment right, when you put it in a broader picture, uh, it's at the very least much more complicated than it seems. And I think the, the broad liberal in the broad constitutional sense dictates that corporations do have First Amendment. Thank you. Thank you for that very punchy presentation. I loved it. A couple of movies I need to watch this weekend. So um, thank you for that. Um, you know, it's I, I think we could have a bigger conversation about liberals being defendants of uh, defenders of free speech. Bill Marshall, I've often said we've stayed in the same spot, but somehow we went from being liberals to conservatives. So I think that's, <laughs> you know, a bigger, a bigger issue. Um, all right, last, but certainly not least, we have our rising star, Evan Ringel. Um, um, Professor Artie and I have known Evan for quite a while because he also is an amazing musician. But now he's turning his attention, um, or I should say simultaneously, he's becoming a great scholar. Um, he received his JD from the law school um, already. He was in my civil procedure class, which was a great joy for me personally. He's now a first year PhD student at uh, UNC School of Journalism and Media. And his current research, conveniently enough, focuses on state attempts to regulate the falsity of political advertisements and speech with a particular emphasis 
on the constitutional barriers to protect uh, potential uh, regulation. Um, he already has his master's from the Hussman School. Um, during his time um, uh, in, in the master's program, he completed a thesis examining the constitutionality of regulations limiting government and private use of facial recognition uh, technology. And he's also written on critical race theory and potential prosecutions under the Espionage Act. So it sounds like, Evan, you like hot topics. And so here you are. Um, it's really appropriate for you to be anchoring this, um, this panel because my understanding is you, are, you and Professor Artie are co-authoring a paper examining some existing state statutes to regulate the very problem we've been talking about today. So I look forward to hearing what you and Professor Artie have been thinking about this topic. Absolutely. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Evan Ringel. Like Professor Poppendre said, I'm a first year PhD candidate at the Hussman School of Journalism and Media here at UNC Chapel Hill. I want to thank Madeline and the First Amendment Law Review for having me here. It's a real honor to be part of this panel that's full of some of the nation's leading First Amendment scholars and my former First Amendment professor, as Professor Marshall just mentioned. So I apologize in advance. Um, but in the aftermath of the 2016 election, we've seen increased attention to the extent of misinformation, whether mis misleading statements or often even direct lies from politicians and their surrogates. We've also seen coordinated disinformation campaigns from both private and state actors. Uh, with the support of the Center for Information Technology and Public Life at UNC, I've been working as the research lead on a project that Professor Papandrea mentioned with Professor David Ardia in the law school where over the past 18 months or so, we've compiled a database of state level statutes that prohibit or limit false statements associated with elections. Now, our goal for this project is to get a sense of the regulatory landscape for a type of law that, as you probably already know, and you've certainly already heard in this panel, may raise some really significant constitutional issues. And so today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we found and give you a sense for just how prevalent these laws are at the state level. So for this project, we reviewed more than 125 state statutes that could regulate the content of election related speech in some way. These laws take one of two basic forms. First, there are statutes that directly target the content of election related speech. And then there are also generally applicable statutes that indirectly implicate election related speech by prohibiting intimidation or fraud associated with an election. And a lot of states have these laws. Our research has found that 38 states have laws directly targeting the content of election related speech in some way. And if you expand that out to include those with laws prohibiting intimidation or fraud, that number goes up to 48 states in the District of Columbia. Now these laws are mostly unenforced, but when they have been challenged in state court, they've generally been struck down. And so in an effort to categorize these laws and to follow in the footsteps of several other First Amendment scholars who have written on election speech, we developed a multi-level taxonomy that I'd like to just briefly lead you through here. So within laws directly targeting the content of election-related speech, we've identified six primary categories of regulation, some of which you've already heard mentioned. So the first and the most common is laws that prohibit false statements about a candidate for public office. So these are generally statements that name or otherwise identify the candidate, statements about a candidate's qualifications, their past actions, their voting record, or their policy positions. And these are statements that have to be factual in nature in order to be actionable. So no statements of opinion. These are verifiable facts. 16 states have this type of law. Three states have laws that merely affirm that defamation law applies to political advertisements or campaign co communications. But 15 states have laws that go beyond that extending liability to any false statement about a candidate, even if it doesn't meet the requirements of defamation. Next category is laws that prohibit false statements about a ballot measure, proposal, referendum, or petition before the electorate. This category is pretty self-explanatory, but here we're talking about statements that are not candidate specific. Instead, they're focused on the contents, purpose, or effect of a ballot measure of some sort. And 14 states have statutes falling within this category. Next, we have laws that prohibit false statements about voting requirements or procedures. This is statements about what is required to vote or register, who can vote, when to vote, how to vote. As you've heard the Democrats on Tuesday, Republicans on Wednesday, that sort of, that sort of remark. And 13 states have laws falling within this category. We have laws that prohibit false statements of source authorization or sponsorship. 
This is false statements about the source of a political advertisement or a campaign communication, or about a speaker's affiliation with an organization. It includes both express and implied statements, and 11 states have laws falling within this category. There are laws that prohibit false statements that a candidate, party, or ballot measure has the endorsement or support of a person or an organization. Unlike the previous category, this is statements of endorsement directed at a candidate or a party, rather than endorsement of an advertisement or a particular communication. And there are nine states with laws falling within this category. Our last direct category is laws that prohibit false statements about incumbency. This includes express or implied statements that a candidate is the incumbent, previously held a public office, or currently holds a public office. It also includes use of the word reelect, and there are seven states with laws falling within this category. So we originally stopped there, but while we were working on the data collection process, there was a prosecution in Michigan that started to make us rethink our approach and broaden out. So the Michigan Attorney General charged two conservative provocateurs, I believe in October of 2020, with multiple felonies for creating and funding robocalls that targeted a bunch of cities, including Detroit. These robocalls were intended to deter residents from voting by mail, warning that it could lead to debt collection, mandatory COVID-19s, warrant serving, et cetera. And one of the laws these men were charged under was a voter intimidation statute. These statutes are mostly on the books to prevent physical acts of voter intimidation. A lot of them refer to specific presence at a polling place or something like that. But other statutes are written broadly enough to cover a whole range of conduct and speech related to elections. So we added two categories to our taxonomy, generally applicable laws that, that target election-related intimidation. So this is laws that prohibit sta statements that intimidate, threaten, or coerce a person to vote or not vote, sign a petition, register to vote, or choose who or what to vote for, and then laws targeting election-related fraud or corruption which is laws that prohibit statements deceiving or defrauding a person to do any of those things. 38 states in the District of Columbia have laws falling within these categories that might reach election speech. Now I wanna identify a couple of other dimensions within these statutes that you've already heard mentioned and that we feel might be important for First Amendment purposes. And the first is scope. So within a particular category, there are huge variations in the breadth of coverage. I'll give you a quick example. Alaska and North Dakota both have laws that punish false statements about a candidate. Alaska's law punishes false statements about a candidate that are made as part of a telephone poll or an organized series of calls and made with the intent to convince potential voters concerning the outcome of an election. This law is relatively tight. North Dakota law, on the other hand, imposes liability if a person knowingly or with reckless disregard for truth or falsity publishes any political advertisement or news release that contains any assertion, representation, or statement of fact, which is untrue, deceptive, or misleading, whether on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for public office, measure, constitutional amendment, or any other issue on an election ballot, and whether the publication is by radio, television, newspaper, billboard, website, or by any other public means. So here the scope varies in a couple of different levels. First, the level of falsity. The Alaska law requires specifically false statements for punishment, while the North Dakota law requires untrue, deceptive, or misleading statements. This can get really messy really fast. And then in medium, the North Dakota, the North Dakota law covers all communication public means, all mediums essentially, while the Alaska law is narrowed specifically to telephone polls or an organized series of calls. Our second dimension is intent. You may have noticed that the North Dakota law imposes liability for a false statement that's made knowingly or with reckless disregard for truth or falsity. You'll see a lot of states using this language, it's the actual malice standard from Sullivan, to try and kind of place laws within that framework. But there are also a lot of states that impose liability regardless of whether the speaker knew or should have known of the statement's falsity, 17 in fact. And that may be a problem from a First Amendment standpoint when courts have repeatedly called for more than strict liability in speech-based contexts. The last dimension is remedy or punishment. A few of these statutes allow the seeking of an injunction, which is likely pretty problematic from First Amendment standpoints. In closing, we view this project as a big set of raw data for future First Amendment analysis. We hope it gives people a better idea at what exactly we're looking at here in terms of regulation on the state level the statutes are broad, they're inconsistent, they're everywhere, and some of them are likely unconstitutional. I'm thrilled to be here and to learn from these wonderful panelists.
Well, thank you, Evan. I know that uh, this is an, an incredible project and I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question from the Q&A right off the bat, just because it really relates directly to what you just said, which is simply what are the long-term applications do you imagine of your research? Uh, in other words, what are you hoping to accomplish with this project? Yeah, sure. So there's a few different goals we have here. First, we we want to just get an idea of what exactly we're looking at here. Uh, there's a 2000 and we've seen case language from like 2016 that said that 16 states have laws that could implicate election related speech. It's really broad. Um, and these laws are pretty consistently struck down. And part of the idea of getting a big landscape is that we can figure out where there are avenues where regulation could be constitutional. So I think Professor Norton mentioned uh, regulations about election procedures and uh, you know, voting registration based things. We want to get a better idea of where the statutes could be OK. Um, we also hope that some of these statutes that seem more pragmatic, more practical, could provide a model from for regulation from other sources. You know, whether it's a social media company trying to target election-related speech or what have you, um, and we're just trying to get a good idea of what's out there. Great, thanks, Evan. So I have some questions. Uh, I would love anyone to jump in on them, but I, I think you know, going off of what Evan was just sharing with us and some of the laws that are out there. I'd like to get the panelists thoughts on the constitutionality of some of these laws and what the obstacles are and how and whether the law should change the the court's jurisprudence on the First Amendment should change and how it should change. Um, and so one thing, you know, it came up in the Alvarez um, case itself, we had some um, justices arguing for more of a balancing or proportionality kind of inquiry that we have this rigid uh, approach to the First Amendment. And do you think that uh, the court should take a different approach um, um, and not be quite so rigid? Uh, would that be a good thing, a bad thing? I, you know, as uh, Clay, I saw you smile because you know I'm interested in this topic more generally, but I'll keep my personal motivations for asking to myself. But I am curious uh, what you um, what you all think. Clay, what you could, sorry, I saw you unmuted. Sure. Well, I, I know why you're smiling, because we're thinking about Justice Breyer here. Uh, and indeed, Justice Breyer in uh, Alvarez, in his separate concurring opinion there, he goes down and talks about whatever we call this standard, right? Uh, I think it was Helen mentioned that, you know, this, there were several different opinions in Alvarez. And in Breyer's was all about proportionality and whether or not strict scrutiny would apply or intermediate scrutiny would apply. Uh, or we're gonna apply exacting scrutiny, which is I think was the term that the plurality used exacting. They didn't say strict scrutiny in that case. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with political speech, we always say that political speech and talk about Citizens United, right? A good political speech case uh, at the heart of the first amendment deserves the most type of protection. Uh, and so, you know, how does that play into the standard of scrutiny that we're going to uh, use? And then again, to go back to where we were talking about earlier, the harms, uh, and I think Bill mentioned this, what's the injury, what's the harm uh, that we're really gonna be focusing on? Uh, and does that rise to the compelling interest level that we have? And then the tailoring part, I think it was interesting when Evan was talking about the Alaska statute being so specific about, was that correct, the tele, uh, just right on telephones, there must have been a case or incident that sparked that, I'm assuming, because why else would we have such a law of that specificity? So yeah, so I guess do you take a, a strict, rigid, categorical approach to scrutiny here, as we typically do, if content-based, then strict scrutiny, you know, and we're dealing with content-based here, or do you take a more uh, values-oriented approach, uh, which is the briar proportionality, is the harm work to First Amendment interest disproportionate? to uh, you know, the benefit of the regulation in question. And he tends to focus on the values, not simply applying a rigid categorical approach. So, I mean, that's kind of the big overlay, I think, about this. And it's always, I think uh, I heard somebody say the most dangerous words for a, uh, from a First Amendment perspective is when the Supreme Court comes down and says the majority opinion written by Justice Breyer, uh, <laughs> because uh, you don't know how that's gonna really come out at that stage. Oh yeah, love Justice Breyer. Um, Marty, not, I mean, I, I just, because I, I really am curious what you think about this. Uh, you defended the Citizens United decision, um, which rested in the marketplace of ideas theory and so on. So do you think that the court should change at all? I'm guessing you, you like the court's approach, but may, maybe not. Um, do you think there should be any changes in the way the court approaches these kinds of questions to deal with what seem to be 
may be real problems, maybe not. That's another topic that Bill raised in his presentation. Oh, we're talking about the false speech. Yes. Issue. Oh, I, I think it's uh, an enormous problem um, on a, on a, as a matter of political science uh, or political theory. And I think Bill explained this. It, it, it's a serious threat to the whole functioning of the democratic process. And, and I don't dispute that there are, are dangers in going down that, that kind of path. And that one reason that I, I really, I, I don't like Breyer in any of his areas, uh, but I, I really don't like him here because he's so nakedly pragmatic. And in the First Amendment, you need much more of a prediction. Otherwise, the chilling effect will, will be enormous. But the, the way I see Alvarez, and, and maybe I'm, I'm, this is wishful thinking on my part, all, all the, the opinion was saying, and you know, announcing the judgment of the court opinion, where lying causes nobody harm, it's protected. I think you could, could have argued that there was harm done there, but I don't know why if you have defamatory harm as a qualifier for the First Amendment, why other kinds of harm can't be viewed the same way. The only distinction I can see is that, well, defamation is a tort that's been around a long time. And I say, so what? Um, the way I see it, if what, what's being regulated is something that causes serious harm to the, the whole process, picking up the New York Times standard and plopping it down there, even if it's not about a particular individual, a particular candidate, could, could fit within our constitutional framework. A knowingly false speech that does serious harm is outside the scope of the First Amendment. The way, the way I would construe everything put together uh, doctrinally and theoretically. Bill, do you think that we need better, you know, we should get the uh, CTAP folks working overtime to generate some empirical studies to show the harm? Would that change what the court, how the court approaches these questions? Well, I think there are two parts there. It's whether the court would be influenced by empirical harm or not. And second of all, the um, whether you could fashion a study that would indicate you know, how much did this particular ad or how much did this particular statement change the course of a particular election? Be interesting to do that if you could do that, but I think that would be, that would be a pretty hard study to make. You know, part of the problem that I see right now, and this is what I was trying to get at in my comments, is that, is that any regulation of campaign content has high problems attached to it that we've already mentioned. Uh, at the same time, there's very serious damage to the political system that's occurring when we have this much falsity in it. The problem that I have is if we're going to engage in that kind of regulation, we should hope that it's effective to accomplish something. And what I'm concerned about, and this is my really cynical point, in this polarized world, it wouldn't make any difference. If a court decision came down and said that candidate A lied, I'm not sure that would influence anybody's vote on whether they would vote for candidate A or not. Maybe it would on a low profile race, but at this point we are so distrustful or, or we're so accepting of lies in our communication that I'm not sure that would work. And if it doesn't work, then my question is why engage in the enterprise? And I really, I do go back and forth on this. Today is Friday, so I'm going one way on it. Talk to me on Monday and I'll make the opposing argument. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a hard problem. Helen, um, I want to get some of your thoughts, both on the course of the court's jurisprudence. We certainly do see, I'm writing about the Mahanoy case, the student speech case, that it, where the court uh, almost uni uh, unanimously embraced a Breyer um, craziness, but anyway, it, a balancing proportionality approach. So we do see this happening in pockets of the First Amendment. Um, do you think that that would be a, a, a better approach here in the election context. And, and then my second question for you, I'm sorry, these are both hard questions, I think, but you can handle them, um, is uh, the role of intent here. Because you, you mentioned in your, um, in your comments, uh, threatening speech that the uh, 
that someone might objectively, no, they might, the listener would think it was a threat, uh, but even if it wasn't intended to be a threat. And um, I, I wasn't sure if there would also be a, a potential, or you were arguing for people who make misstatements that lead to incitement. I'm not sure you, you made that argument, but you mentioned true threats and incitement is not protected speech, but is there a way you could um, use those categories and, and apply them uh, maybe like aiding and abetting threats and incitement by, you know, sharing false information. I just wanted you to clarify that as well. Yeah, thanks, Mary Rose. So I'll take the second question first. If we just, uh, I did make a big detour from lies to threats um, because I was, I was trying to find a way in which we could understand certain lies about election fraud as inflicting the sorts of harms that are really traditionally regulable. Right and true threats are right because of the harm that they inflict on the the target of the threat. Right to make somebody fear for their their physical safety changes the course of their life, including of course their willingness to speak out on on certain issues. So if we understand that's the reason that we don't protect true threats under the First Amendment, it seems to me that functional approach, which is how I, I generally approach these questions, that functional approach recognizes that if the listener is reasonable, right, not a subjective idiosyncratic, but the listener is reasonable in perceiving this as a threat, which means that he or she may stop being an election official or stop criticizing the government, um, then that, that justifies its regulation consistent with the First Amendment. If we talk about the regulation of lies, and I, I guess I should define about how I'm talking about lies when I think they're regulable, I would, I would, I would describe them as intentional, uh, intentionally or recklessly false statements of fact with the intent uh, of objectively verifiable fact, like what day is the election with the intent to make the listener believe them to be true. So that would certainly include folks who are trying to deceive listeners as well as speakers who are reckless. They, they don't care, they have no interest in whether or not what they're saying is true um, or false. And, and I think that strikes a balance between not chilling and punishing accidental misstatements of fact and focusing on misstatements of fact, misrepresentations of fact that are made with a, a more culpable mental state, intent or recklessness. So going back to your first um, question, I, I'll, I'll put in a plug for Breyer's approach. I, I think one of the things that I like that I like about his approach, certainly with respect to lies and maybe in other areas, again, I'm a, sort of a functionalist in these matters, is that um, what makes me crazy is when um, folks, lawyers, judges, you name it, pretend that hard questions are in fact easy. And these are hard questions, right? Lies inflict all sorts of harms, right? Some of them are more easily measured than others, but just because they're not easy to measure doesn't mean that they're not harmful. And it lies in the election context, I think in, inflict all sorts of harm. And on the other side, we should justifiably worry about giving the government the power to enforce these laws because election contexts are so highly charged. And there's all sorts of danger for partisan self-interest in abuse. So pretending this is an easy matter that can be handled through bright line rules, I, I, I think is, is a fiction. So I understand Breyer to be saying, let's not pretend, you know, let's do the hard work um, of assessing the dangers here. And this is why I'm sort of interested in the continuum of First Amendment difficulty or risk. Does that make the outcome much more, much less predictable? You bet, right? But it's, but I, I, I think in, in very difficult areas, that's what we're gonna get some some amount of difficulty and unpredictability. Yeah, I mean, I'll say in the research I've been doing, you certainly find the court embracing or more likely to embrace a balancing test in areas where it's having trouble finding its way using traditional doctrine. Like it feels like it leads to results that are not, um, they don't feel right. Uh, like in the government speech doctrine for we've, that, you know, I, we've studied extensively um, where we don't, we don't have the normal rules and the court's really finding its way there as well. Oh, Bill raises his hand, Bill. There, there you go. Um, yeah, there, there are a few folks who have argued that there should be a category called election speech that has its own set of rules. And rather than trying to fit all of these kinds of issues into current a current jurisprudence that we try to think about a way to deal with these issues specifically. I'm not necessarily a fan of that, but I think that that at least is worth thinking about that because you know the interest in speaking in political matters is so high, and the interest also in in regulating the political process to assure its integrity is so high, that maybe we just ought to wholesale move this kind of area out 
of, of regular First Amendment jurisprudence and create its own subset. You know, arguably the court may have did, done that in Burson versus Freeman in which it allowed the regulation of, of uh, electioneering right next to polls. There's no First Amendment jurisprudence in the world that would say that that's okay under existing theory, but the court kind of sloughed around and upheld it anyway. Um, maybe there's something something to follow with respect to that. Yeah, it's tricky because, um, you know, we are talking in, for the most part in core political speech, which is the highest level of speech. So it's uh, it, it does raise uh, some interesting questions of carving that out for maybe less. I mean, if it's going to be different protection, it's likely to be lesser protection, although maybe there's good reason for that. I love this. I feel like I'm running a class with the most brilliant minds in America. Um, uh, Clay, I see your hand is up. So why are you calling on me then? I don't get that. But uh, <laughs> I know, Marty, I skip you, go to Marty. <laughs> uh, my quite, my, mine goes back to what Helen was talking about on true threats. Uh, and, and that's one of the areas the court needs to clarify with regard to intent. And we know they, they punted on the intent in the Alanis case. Uh, a couple of years ago, a case down here in Florida, Perez, uh, they decided not to hear the case. And I believe Sotomayor wrote a, a really good opinion uh, in the denial of that certiorari that they need to take a case clarifying intent. I also think it's interesting that Helen's definition of that, of you know it's false, you act with reckless disregard, taps into Evan's findings. I think that a lot of states you were suggesting, I think Evan have that, right, in, in, in their statutes. They're, they're importing Times versus Sullivan's actual malice into that definition. But again, my big picture, I think the true threats on intent, and that's really relevant here, is it simply the objective observer taking that, how would a reasonable person interpret the meaning of it versus is there an intent to lie? So just to clarify, the court should clarify yeah. that at some point soon, hopefully. That's interesting. Uh, Marty. Oh, you're muted. Uh, one quick thing to Helen, one quick thing to Bill. Uh, Helen, the problem with the Breyer kind of approach, and I'm drawing on this, this great constitutional scholar, Clint Eastwood, a lot, is feel lucky punk. If, if we are going to have that kind of approach case by case, what is the speaker supposed to think before he or she talks? Do you want to roll the dice that uh, you're going to get that you may guess wrong and get punished? you'll keep your mouth shut. It's, it, that leads to a, a totally uh, unacceptable chilling effect on speakers if you can't have some level of predictability rather than Justice Breyer sticking his finger around and saying, yeah, well, maybe it's this way, maybe, it, maybe it's that way. The one quick thing to Bill, maybe I misunderstood something, I don't, didn't understand this kind of thing to be a, um, a situation where a court would just issue a declaratory judgment that this was a lie and that would be the only consequence. I, I assume there would be some kind of fine, some kind of penalty that would presumably have deterred them. And the final point is to Bill, I think this, this is so ironic. When I started my whole career, I was writing about commercial speech being part of the First Amendment and everybody said to me, oh, that's not right. The First Amendment is about political speech. And now <laughs> Bill is telling me maybe political speech has become so important, it's past the First Amendment uh, and has its own category. I thought the guts of the First Amendment was about controlling uh, election speech. And the person case you mentioned, why isn't that just time, place, manner, regulation? I, I didn't find it such a problem. I'm not, I'm not just to be clear, Marty, I'm not arguing to go down that way. I'm saying some people have suggested it and it might create a different kind of balancing to separate things, but I, I take your point. Evan, that's great you raised your hand because I was gonna call you. Oh, but Helen wants to talk, so you're gonna wait. Helen, go ahead. Yeah, I'll be real quick, Evan, I promise. Um, just to respond to Marty. So, you know, as a descriptive matter, of course, constitutional law, including and especially First Amendment law is riddled with all sorts of balancing tests and intermediate scrutiny. And of course that um, folks may or may not be critical of it, but as a, just as a, as a descriptive matter, it's something that routinely engage in. And I guess the thing that I wanna take from Breyer is maybe less the um, approach to intermediate scrutiny, but the recognition that there are 
uh, significant interests, First Amendment interests on both sides of this. Um, for that listeners, for example, have all sorts of First Amendment interests. And I think that they include in a number of situations not being uh, deceived. And of course, speakers have First Amendment interests as well. And I, I think that what makes this a hard problem and not an easy problem is wrestling with those, those interests on both, both sides of the equation. Well, that's great, Helen. Yeah, I mean, one, one possible path forward is to flesh out what these interests are and what these harms are. And we see that happening um, as a bigger trend in the First Amendment where you have more articulation of the harms that speech can cause. So maybe that would be uh, one path. Evan, um, you raised your hand, but whatever you wanna say, you can say it. But I also just wanted you to share with, the, with our audience what you see in these statutes as far as intent standards and you kind of uh, nodded in response to Clay, but do you see the, the legislatures generally embracing some sort of intent standard? And the other related question, just going to these statutes is, do you see the statutes um, imposing different rules on candidates versus general public because you know when Helen was talking about false statements of fact I mean I think one of the problems we're seeing is that the false false speech is getting spread um, on social media by people who are not candidates necessarily at least you know and maybe you could find the first mover and go after that person but um, you know would do, do you see the states distinguishing between candidates or campaigns versus individuals is that something and I, I find it curious because these legislative responses don't appear to be rooted in our first amendment really um or you know like no one did a real deep dive into what would be allowed and not allowed but they're they seem to be like a common sense like they're, they're coming from right. a common sense kind of concern so that's I, my I question think... you say whatever you wanted to say <laughs> wonderful questions of course uh, i think that that we're much like I'm somewhat unsurprisingly, I guess it's kind of all over the map on several different levels. So first, I just wanted to say something about the remedies that we're seeing with these statutes, um, that it's generally a lot of these statutes are criminal statutes uh, with fine or potential imprisonment. There are a handful of statutes that create a civil right of action, uh, a couple that allow a registered voter to seek the removal of a candidate who is directly responsible for producing or disseminating a false statement. Um, and then in terms of intent, it's a mix again. So there are a lot of statutes that do use the Sullivan language, like I said, this, this reckless disregard um, or uh, knowing falsity. And then at the same time, there are, I would say, almost a similar number of statutes that have more of a strict liability, like in more focused on what actually happened, you know, like it, on two different levels. So if you're looking at more like direct false statements, statements that were false, that were disseminated, and then on intent, uh, or sorry, on intimidation uh, category, there's a differentiation between statutes that, uh, or sorry, that statements that were intended to intimidate uh, to affect voting, uh, and then statements that were intimidating that had the effect of causing of causing some sort of change in voting behavior, whether that's voting for a different candidate or choosing not to vote, not to register, that sort of thing. So there is this dichotomy there between intent to intimidate and causing election harm and effect of intimidation uh, causing election harm, uh, which I think is very interesting and kind of evenly split again. And I know you asked one more question, and I, I cannot I, was remember at, what it was. I think it was about speakers versus just general public. Yeah, yeah. So again, another area where we're all over the map. There are most statute, there are only a handful of candidate-specific statutes. Um, most apply more broadly. Um, some of those candidate-specific statutes also refer to uh, a candidate or an authorized representative, something like that. So, you know, like a member of the campaign team. Uh, a lot of these states seem like they've drafted these statutes just to cover like every possible, you know, every possible contingency. So they'll say any person or any candidate or any, any representative or, you know, spread out really broadly to try and I think spread as a wide a web as possible. Thank you, Evan. Well, we do have some questions from the audience, but it, there is a theme among these questions. So uh, one of the themes is that we're just in a bad place as a society. Um, so is there a way to get back to a society in which truth is once again desired and valued in the marketplace of ideas rather than the current state of acceptance of false information, 
an unwavering allegiance to political um, affiliation. Um, you know, this idea of just, uh, is there any way we can get back there? And I, I guess I would add to that is, is, is focusing on the First Amendment and what states can and can't do, or the federal government can and can't do, going to be part of this solution? Should it be part of the solution? Um, how, how can we solve what, what it seems to be a, a real problem? Anyone? Helen, you unmuted. I don't know if you wanted to start. Yeah, I really appreciate the questions that I saw in the in the Q and A, and one of them asks about you know how how can we have greater trust in candidates? Um, the political science and the philosophy literature on trust, at least some of it, I'm thinking about Russell Harden, but there's others. Basically, says you know it's actually not so important and maybe not helpful for the public to trust government. Right? That our cost we have a government in part because we just distrust each other and we want some organizing principles so that we can work together. Uh, but on the other hand, obviously, the Constitution itself is rooted in distrust of the government and for for often often for good reasons. So it may not be so important that people trust the government. But then these writers say what would actually would be good is if the government behaved in trustworthy ways. And under this view, trust is um, it's a cognitive assessment. It's based on inductive reasoning. You trust folks based on your personal experiences with them as trustworthy or not or based on their reputation as trustworthy or not. So one approach is to demand more of candidates, right? Demand that they behave in trustworthy ways. What might that mean? Be transparent, be, have some epistemic humility, resist appeals to polarization and tribalism. Um, that might be a lot to ask, but thinking, I think it's helpful to think about what would it take for folks to behave in trustworthy ways? And this question is complicated by Bill's very, very good question. What do we do about the fact that um, voters don't seem to value truth or uh, to apply it to my, my hypothetical here, voters don't seem to apply, uh, value trustworthy behavior in that it seems increasingly trust isn't based on our own experiences with the object. We trust folks if our tribe, if our team tells us that they're trustworthy or not. And, and that's what we've got to break through. My son was starting to practice his cello, so I muted. Um, Marty, <laughs> um, it looked like you had something to say about this. Yeah, I, Helen, I'm sorry. It just, I, get, I get triggered when I hear this described as a mutual kind of thing. Oh, both sides do this. No, both sides don't do it. I, I go back, sadly, uh, further than any of you, and I've watched politics since I was a little boy. I have never seen a situation where one of the two major parties doesn't believe in democracy. And th that's a scary situation in general. It's especially scary to me since I teach constitutional law and I might be out of a job in a couple of years. Um, we have a situation where facts do matter to some people and don't matter to the other side. And I. I, you know, your tribe, my tribe. No, no, it's, it's, let's put the blame here where, where it really is. It's one side where facts don't matter. Um, and just leave it at that. Yeah, that, that was uh, another question we got uh, relates to what you just said, Marty, which is um, the question was, since determining what constitutes misinformation is a subjective and biased endeavor, why not just allow misinformation on both sides so it evens out. So Marty's response appears to be it's not really even, so that would be uh, problematic. Any other reaction to either what Marty just said or to that particular question? Evan. Yeah, I think that it's deeply contextual. And then there's also, I think ultimately, I believe it's Catherine Ross who says in her wonderful article, Ministry of Truth at the end that the solution is a change in cultural norms that goes far beyond the scope of this paper. Um, and I think that's that's a big part of it, right? Is that there is, as Professor Marshall said, a real kind of apathy towards, or potentially even a one-sided apathy towards misinformation that is only seems to be increasing. And with that lack of motivation to really 
cure these problems. Like this is not, you know, this is not a universal call to eradicate misinformation. And I think that we have to keep that in mind as we're discussing these issues is that it's not universal and not there's not a universal motivation from everyone that we need to solve this issue. Um, I think that's really problematic and kind of limits the solutions, at least the solutions that are based on, you know, wanting it. Yeah, and I guess, uh, you know, just to help segue, we have one minute left uh, to one of the later panels. I mean, Clay talked about in his talk, which uh, was a while ago now in our one hour and a half session, um, about some of the efforts to regulate social media. But if the traditional view, or I guess the, the predominant view right now, which is social media platforms have these First Amendment defenses from regulation, that means they're outside of a First Amendment zone. And, and so the things we've been talking about here would not control their decisions. And so that's something else. Uh, you know, I look forward to hearing that panel later today, but you're right. It's a much deeper, uh, it's a much deeper problem beyond these very difficult First Amendment questions. Bill, you're yeah, going to close it out. You're going to well, close it out, Bill. I'm planning on doing it with one line from the cartoonist Walt Kelly, who said, we have met the enemy and they are us. Love it, Bill. Love it. All right. We are the enemy. Thank you. You were all amazing. I think you lived up to my billing. Thank you so much. Thank you, audience, for your very good questions. And I think we have a lunch break now. So go eat, get refreshed, refueled. See you at one o'clock. Maddie, you're going to come on for a second. Just one second. Um, and I'll just reiterate everything you just said. This was really, really fun to watch and to hear all of you um, and all of your presentations and your back and forth with one another. So thank all of you. And thank you, Professor Papandrea, for moderating all of that. Um, one quick announcement for those of you doing CLE, I did forget to mention a term at the beginning, so I'll mention them both now. Uh, for panel one, you should have uh, election misinformation as your first term and Citizens United as your second. Um, and I will mention all of these at the very end of the symposium so you can double check that you've got all of those right. Um, and with that, yes, we will go on a lunch break until one o'clock. This will stay open um, so it doesn't go away, but you can log off and it'll be here for you when we come back together at one. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank Daddy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks y'all. Let's go for your walk.
All right, hello everybody um, and welcome to this afternoon. Um, we're going to get started with our second panel for today, which is going to focus on regulating money and transparency in election related speech. Um, I think some of our attendees are still trickling in, but hopefully those of you um, who are applying for CLE credit for the symposium are here. And again, I will mention these terms at the very end of symposium. So in case you are missing this one, not to worry. Um, but for panel two, the first term you'll want to have for your CLE worksheet is political ads. Um, to get us started on panel two, um, I will be introducing Professor Eric Muller, who has graciously agreed to moderate this panel for us. Um, Professor Muller, first of all, thank you so much for being here and for doing this. Pleasure. Um, Professor Muller joined the Carolina Law Faculty in 1998 and serves as the Dan K. Moore Distinguished Professor in Jurisprudence and Ethics. He is one of the leading scholars of the removal and imprisonment of Japanese Americans in World War II and has published extensively in the field for more than two decades. He's also published in the areas of constitutional criminal procedure, the law of slavery, and the Nazi legal system. <clears throat> Professor Muller attended Yale Law School where he was current topics editor for the Yale Law and Policy Review. He then clerked for Judge H. Lee Sorkin of the United States District Court for the District of New Jersey. He worked briefly for a litigation firm in New York City and then served as an assistant U.S. attorney in the District of New Jersey before entering academia as an assistant professor at the University of Wyoming College of Law. At UNC, Professor Muller has served as the law school's associate dean for faculty development and as director of the Center for Faculty Excellence the Faculty Development Center serving the entire university. Um, Professor Miller, thanks again so much for being here and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And I, am I first, am I unmuted? That's always the first item on the checklist. Um, I'm re I was really happy to step in and do this um, for this very interesting panel with some wonderful panelists. Um, I was also very happy that um, this event was not canceled. I don't know if it was mentioned this morning that even though much of the university is doing remote education. This is this is something about the South now. Even though much of the much of the university is doing remote education, um, the entire university's classes were canceled today because of the weather. So uh, apparently, e the weather even affects Zoom. So I'm really glad that this uh, that this was able to go forward. Um, what I'd like to do is um, uh, introduce our panelists, and I'm going to assume, not having spoken to them uh, beforehand, that it's okay if uh, you speak uh, in the order in which you're listed on the program, which would be Professor Hazen and then Professor Torres Spellacy and then Professor Kendrick. Is, uh, is that okay with all of you? Yeah, is that going to work? All right. Well, I think what I'd like to do is um, introduce each of you right before you speak, and that way um, it'll be a little bit more present in people's minds. Um, I'm sorry for that mispronunciation of your last name, and I will uh, duly note it. Um, so Professor Richard Hassan is going to go first, and that is the correct pronunciation. My apologies. Uh, Professor Hassan is Chancellor's Professor of Law and Political Science at UC Irvine co-director there of the Fair Elections and Free Speech Center, nationally recognized expert in election law and in campaign finance regulation. He also writes in the areas of legislation, statutory interpretation, remedies, and torts. Uh, he's a co-author of a leading casebook uh, in election law and in remedies and served in 2020 as a CNN election law analyst, although there was very little to talk about in the 2020 election. <laughs> From 2001 to 2010, he served with Dan Lowenstein as founding co-editor of the quarterly peer-reviewed publication called Election Law Journal, and is the author of over 100 articles on election law issues published in journals, including Harvard, Harvard's Law Review, the Stanford Law Review, and Supreme Court Review, elected to the American Law Institute in 2009, and Professor Hassan serves as reporter along with Professor Douglas Laycock on the ALI's Law Reform Project, uh, a significant project, of course, the restatement third of torts uh, in the remedies area. So Professor Hassan, um, please um, take it away. 
Well, I remember to unmute. So I've, I've done one thing right. So I'm glad, glad about that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to, to um, Madeline and to the entire First Amendment Law Review Board. Let me say that uh, the last time I spoke before the First Amendment Law Review, I presented a paper called Sheep Speech, and that paper has now grown into a book. And I'm going to talk about a little piece of that book. But I have very warm feelings for the First Amendment Law Review since it got me thinking about these issues and for my uh, good friends on the uh, UNC faculty. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk about a subject that kind of straddles the three different topics uh, within the theme of today's program. Um, which uh, addresses, and I'll say just the larger book project, addresses the question of what can law do and what could be done beyond law to deal with the threat of disinformation and other changes in our politics that have made it uh, harder for voters to get accurate information and that have undermined voters' confidence in the fairness and integrity of the election process. And uh, there was a lot of talk about those issues in in the first panel, I'm going to focus on one narrow piece of my, I have a set of about eight legislative proposals that I think could help deal with the problem of disinformation uh, in our uh, elections um, and, and disinformation related problems in our elections. I'm going to focus on one piece of it, which has to do with something that's called micro-targeting, political micro-targeting. So this has to do with campaign advertising. It's campaign advertising that is shared on social media and rather than simply use uh, Facebook or Twitter to post a general ad promoting a candidate for uh, office or, or ballot measure or, or opposing candidate, um, you use the extensive and uh, unprecedented amount of data that the social media platforms gather about you um, uh, as a way of trying to target advertising to particular populations. Uh, so the way this may work is a campaign like the Trump campaign or the Biden campaign may have a whole uh, set of people that they uh, know are, are campaign uh, supporters. They may find their social media accounts and then they can put in an, a request to uh, Facebook to use what's called the lookalike feature on Facebook, where Facebook will compare data between people who are in the list supplied by the campaign with those within the massive Facebook uh, database in order to target certain ads at certain populations. And so you might have one set of ads targeted at rural older white men. You might have another set of ads that are targeted to young Latina women. And you might uh, target those ads specifically towards issues and um, interests that the social media data gathering uh, uh, process has proven to be things that are salient to those people. And the question is, first of all, what's the problem with micro-targeting if there is one, and then what to do about it? And so the problem, and here I'm drawing on the work of Yochai Benkler and his co-authors at Harvard, uh, in their book, Network Propaganda, uh, is that um, the amount of data and the extent of the data that is mined by these social media companies and used for advertising targeting in general is so much more detailed and intrusive than anything that uh, could ever have been done before that uh, there's really a question as to whether voters recognize that they're giving up this information and can in, in a sense, have their autonomy undermined because they have this advertising that is so directly targeted to them to try to manipulate public opinion. Uh, and while Benkler and his co-authors are quite skeptical of lots of regulation and skeptical of many uh, of the claims about echo chambers and other things made about politics on social media, uh, they are very concerned, as am I, about the danger of micro-targeting, that it's this kind of political advertising that is, in a, in a sense, unfair. It's the difference, as I argue in my book, between uh, being, taking a photograph of someone uh, versus being able to have a mind reading machine. And while we might not have uh, too much objection uh, when we're in public to having our photo taken, we might not realize that you know, we were being subject to uh, having our innermost thoughts uh, revealed to people who are trying to manipulate us for political reasons. Uh, so what could be done about the issue of campaign-oriented micro-targeting? Um, uh, 
one way to think about this uh, is uh, that the concern here is more about voter privacy than about our usual requirements of disclosure. And so I argue that ideally we should have a ban on micro-targeting that is done by uh, these um, uh, social media companies in coordination with campaigns. That is campaigns can still come up with their list of people they wanna target. They can send whatever ads they want to whoever they want, but they cannot use the data that social media companies collect uh, in order to target certain ads at certain populations that look like the ones who are um, within the realm of people that have voluntarily opted into uh, getting information from the campaign. So could such a law help? I think it could help because I think that it would um, prevent a kind of manipulation when you're a can campaign and you have to target the same information to all voters. You're much less likely to send disinformation to particular voters to try to target them uh, in particular. Um, it also preserves voter autonomy in the sense that people are not being manipulated by uh, uh, um, advertising that preys on what many voters would consider to be secret information about them. The problem with this proposal to target, uh, to ban micro-targeting of political advertising uh, is that it may run afoul of the First Amendment. Let me talk about a couple of ways that it might. Uh, first, um, if you say that political micro-targeting is banned, but other micro-targeting, for example, figuring out who to try to sell a sofa to uh, is not, uh, then you're engaged in a content-based restriction on speech uh, the Supreme Court in uh, Reed uh, versus Town of Gilbert has indicated that such uh, types of content-related advertising uh, is um, going to be subject to strict scrutiny. Uh, you could argue that voter protection is the, the reason that could satisfy strict scrutiny, given the current Supreme Court and its embrace of the marketplace of ideas approach, which Professor Marshall talked about in the last panel. Uh, it's, I'm kind of skeptical that the court would accept uh, that idea, that it would be permissible to target people as voters, but not people as consumers. Uh, there, the, the further case, the bar case uh, involving the um, ban on robocalls, except for government debt collection, the court struck that down as a violation, as a content-based um, restriction on speech. And so one way we might think of resolving this question is we could uh, make the ban larger and say no micro-targeting of any advertising at all. And I think that doing that would solve the content-based problem uh, because you'd be saying all advertising, whether it's political advertising or SOFA advertising, uh, would be subject to the same rules. Uh, this creates two problems. Uh, number one, it creates a legal problem which is that um, uh, there's a case from a few years back uh, called Sorrell versus IMS Health Services, uh, which suggests that there's a First Amendment right to collect and use data. It's not clear exactly how far that case goes and how exactly uh, it might apply in this context, but there certainly is a legal argument that could be raised that prohibiting people from using whatever data, data they collect, so long as they're not using illegal means to collect the data, is um, something that is itself protected by the First Amendment. But the other problem with this is that it is politically very difficult to see how you could get Congress to enact a full ban on micro-targeting of all advertising on social media companies, because this is how social media companies make their money. That is more than anything else, they are able to tell advertisers that we know a lot about the people who are on uh, our platforms, and we use that information for uh, our um, advertising purposes. You'd break the entire business model of these companies. These companies are quite powerful. And so politically, it's very hard to uh, think about how to um, uh, get around the political problem of going with a broader ban. And so that leaves us with what I think of, and I'll end on this because I know we're supposed to keep these presentations to 10 minutes. Uh, that uh, leaves us with uh, what I would uh, consider to be um, uh, less uh, extreme solutions. Uh, for example, um, Anne Ravel and Abby Wood have proposed a requirement of disclosure of uh, advertising uh, that is micro-targeted advertising. And so uh, a, if, if a candidate is able to micro-target, uh, the candidate's opponent 
would have access to be able to purchase at the same rates, the same micro targeting, able to see what the advertisement was and be able to uh, counter that uh, type of advertising. Uh, the benefit of this uh, as a second best solution is that disclosure laws are more likely to be upheld. And also, if you do believe, uh, as some of the justices on the Supreme Court seem to, still in the marketplace of ideas approach, the fact that you'd be having disclosure, you'd be able to promote the marketplace of ideas by making it easier for people to communicate. So rather than being secret messages being sent to a computer curated list of people, uh, you'd be able to have uh, public information about who is being targeted for the messages. And that itself might deter sending misinformation or disinformation to particular groups of people because you'd have to disclose what you were saying and who you were saying it to. And with that, let me turn it back to Eric and look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks very much. Uh, very interesting. A, a couple of questions have already popped into my head, but we'll get to that later. Um, our second speaker um, uh, will be um, Chara torres Spellacy, who is a professor of law uh, at Stetson University College of Law, where she teaches courses in election law, corporate governance, business entities, and constitutional law. Um, she was counsel in the democracy program of the Brennan Center uh, for Justice at NYU, uh, where she provided guidance on issues of money and politics and the judiciary to state and federal lawmakers. She was an associate at Arnold and Porter and a staffer for Senator Dick Durbin. Um, she's the author of the books Corporate Citizen, An Argument for the Separation of Corporation and State from 2016, and then three years later in 2019, a book called Political Brands. She researches and speaks publicly on campaign finance law, as well as on judicial selection. She has spoken at symposia at 49 universities, as well as internationally, as far as Mexico and Hong Kong. In 2016, she spoke at the Federal Election Commission, the FEC, at a forum on dark money and foreign money and its influence in US elections. Professor Torres Spellacy, welcome and thank you. Thank you. So I am going to try to share my PowerPoint with all of you. And let's see if this feels like working. Okay. It's yep. It's okay. Working. Awesome. Um, so my name is Chara Torres Felicy. I'm going to talk about seen and unseen money in politics. Uh, this semester, I am visiting at American University. And then my home institution is Stetson University here in Florida. So right now I'm writing my third book on corporate money and politics. And as I'm writing this, uh, two things strike me. One, that money and politics has always been broader than what is captured in the campaign finance system. There's almost always money hiding under the floorboards. And the second thing that strikes me is that election lawyers and election law professors, I think really have a blind spot for criminality. And I think this comes from the way that the academy is siloed. Uh, election lawyers and election law professors are put in this strange position where we have to be cheerleaders for the democracy. Uh, and I think that leads to a certain blindness that we would perhaps not have if we focused more on white collar crime. Uh, and I think what also influences this uh, bias, if you will, on the part of uh, election law professors is the way that the Supreme Court has looked at the issue of money in politics. Uh, the Supreme Court has equated money with speech and thus gives money uh, First Amendment protections. And I think if you think of the world that way, then you're going to have a very rose colored glasses way of looking at our electoral process. Because what you have is protected First Amendment activity, speech and spending and spending on speech and you know, billions of dollars uh, going into political ads. But that is all uh, thought of as in a positive light because it's protected by the First Amendment. And then it leads to a free and fair election. But I wanted to tell you, oh, and I think that myth is only matched by love of the flag, uh, mom and apple pie. But I wanted to tell you a more negative story from my home state of Florida. 
Uh, so for years and years and years, going back at least eight years, uh, during the election season, reporters from local papers would ask me about hobby candidates and fake candidates, and I could not get at what these reporters were, you know, what are you trying to ask me? Uh, and using, you know, my best pen gloss, I would respond to these reporters who were asking about fake candidates with new candidates are great, uh, showing you know, my bias as an election lawyer and as a cheerleader for democracy. And in retrospect, I think what they were asking me about was a criminal conspiracy. And I, I'm a little miffed at myself that I didn't see it that way because I've written about money in politics and criminal conspiracies, uh, specifically what happened in Watergate. And I think one of the lessons of Watergate is if you wanna know what's happening in American politics, follow the money. And if you follow the money that was going into the Committee for the Re-election of the President, which has the awesome acronym CREEP, money from CREEP came from these uh, corporations, which was uh, perfectly illegal both then and now. And that illegal corporate money uh, was then used for other illegal actions, including these notorious burglaries. So let's turn to a more modern example. What happened in the 2020 election in my home state of Florida? So in 2020, uh, Democratic Florida voters were, re received mailers that looked like this. Um, and I want you to remember these names, Alex and Justine. And as you can see from these flyers, they used a stock image of a uh, African-American actress and this, she is not either of these candidates. Uh, so Justine, Justine is the white woman uh, on your screen, not the black woman on the mailer. And the press in Florida has deemed this the ghost candidate scandal. So basically what happened in 2020 is hundreds of thousands of dollars was spent on these mailers and the mailers went to Democratic uh, voters with the hope of getting uh, Democratic voters to vote for these non-party affiliated candidates with the purpose of electing Republicans in these races. And in two of the races where there were ghost candidates, arguably it didn't end up making a difference. I mean, one can argue, I think, both ways, but in District 37, I think it really did make a difference. Uh, that was an election that came down to 32 uh, votes. So let's follow some of the money in this Florida election. Now, the reason why I am considering this as a corporate money and politics story is intrepid reporters, both in Florida and nationally, have uh, looked into where did this money for these uh, ghost candidates come from? And one of the things that they have pointed to is a company called Florida Power and Light. So Florida Power and Light, uh, when you look at their campaign finance spending, it's not outrageously large for a, a entity their size, but you know they are spending millions of dollars uh, over the past two decades. And if you look at what is reported in the campaign finance system in 2020, Florida Power and Light looks uh, almost dainty. They are giving uh, to candidates uh, at the $1,000 uh, level, which is legal under Florida law. Corporations can give directly to candidates here. And that might leave you with quite the misimpression of what they were really doing in the 2020 election. And so now what we have are documents from whistleblowers given to reporters and this is one such document. So this is a invoice uh, from a Alabama uh, political consultancy called Matrix. And they are billing Florida Power and Light for over a million dollars uh, during the 2020 election. And so what reporters have pieced together is this picture, allegedly, that Florida Power and Light gave to an entity 
matrix, uh, that Alabama entity, that then gave to an entity called Proclivity, which then changed its name to Grow United. And that entity gave to PACs, including one called Our Florida, and then one maybe so ironically called uh, The Truth. And then it was those PACs that spent the hundreds of thousands of dollars on the misleading mailers sent to Democratic voters. And one of the reasons that I'm concerned about Florida Power and Light is not only is it a large entity in its own right, it is also a subsidiary of a publicly traded company uh, known as Next Era Energy. And Next Era Energy has also spent millions of dollars that we can find in our campaign finance system. But again, it's sort of for an entity their size, it's not particularly remarkable. But I worry about entities as big as Next Era being in our democracy because, uh, you know, depending on the day and the stock price, they have a market cap of over $100 billion. So back to our uh, District 37 race in Florida. I find this one particularly pernicious because uh, the ghost candidate had the exact same last name as the Democratic incumbent. And again, this race came down to 32 votes. And the ghost candidate received far more than that. So I think you can make a very good argument that the having this ghost candidate in this race made a difference. Now, uh, they use the same mailer with the same actress. Uh, and But the real Alex Rodriguez is uh, the man on your screen. And he uh, allegedly uh, received a $50,000 bribe from a former state senator in Florida named Frank Artiles. And he was paid this money to be a ghost candidate. Uh, and one of the things that just happened last month in Florida is Alex Rodriguez actually pled guilty to his behavior in uh, being a ghost candidate and taking that money. So I think by pleading guilty, he has now avoided jail time, and but he will be on the hook for uh, $20,000 uh, as a fine and punishment. And what I presume is happening here is that he has turned state's evidence against his former co-conspirator, uh, Frank Artilis. So we'll see in, in in 2022, whether um, we have a trial for Mr. Artilis, whether he pleads guilty, whether he is found guilty if he goes to trial. And I'm really hoping they actually have a trial and he doesn't just plead guilty because I really am curious about the money flowing in this 2020 scheme. Was Did anyone have knowledge at Florida Power and Light that this is the way their money would be used? And the, going up the corporate chain, did, did anyone at Next Era uh, Energy have any fingerprints on any of this? Oops. So before I showed you sort of like the positive view of money and politics, it's all protected First Amendment activity and it leads to a free and fair election. I think what happened in, in Senate District 37 in Florida in 2020 paints a far darker picture. We have a polluting industry spending dark money to help finance fake candidates. One fake candidate has already pled guilty to his participation in this crime. And so one of the things that I'm looking at as I'm writing this chapter of uh, this book is Key Bono, basically who is benefiting from this. I think a clear beneficiary of all of this nonsense were the Republican candidates in these Senate races. They all won their Senate races and uh, none of them has chosen to resign. And so I would urge my fellow election scholars when they are following the money to look at more than just what you can find in open secrets. There's almost always money hidden under the floorboards. And I wanted to leave you with this thought, which is also from the 2020 election, but at the national level. Who paid for this? Who paid for the insurrection? And when we are thinking about money and politics, should that be part of the tally or not part of the tally? 
you know, the official uh, cost of the 2020 election at the federal level is somewhere between 14 and $15 billion. Should we add this to the cost of what the 2020 election um, really was or not? Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Char. That was very interesting. Um, a story that I was not familiar with, um, not a particularly happy story, but a very <laughs> enthralling one. Um, uh, our final panelist is Leslie Kendrick, um, who is the White Burkett Miller Professor of Law and Public Affairs and the director of the Center for the First Amendment at the University of Virginia's Law School. Her research has appeared in the Harvard Law Review, Columbia Law Review, the Michigan Law Review, and Philosophy and Public Affairs, among other journals. She's a member of the American Law Institute and an advisor on the restatement of law third torts in the area of defamation and privacy. She's the co-author of a leading torts case book, Tort Law Responsibilities and Redress, with John Goldberg, Anthony Seabach, and Benjamin Sapersky. At UVA, Kendrick recently completed four years as vice dean. She clerked for Judge Harvey Wilkinson III on the Fourth Circuit and for Justice David Souter on the Supreme Court of the United States. Professor Kendrick. Thank you so much, Eric. And thank you to everyone at the Law Review. Madeline, thank you so much for all of your work putting this together. Everyone at UNC, it's really a pleasure to be part of this day, and I've enjoyed and learned so much from it. Uh, so far, I also have to say that as a um, as a UNC alum myself, I went there for undergrad. I'm particularly uh, happy to be uh, rejoining my alma mater, if only virtually today. So the topic of this panel is um, transparency and, and how that relates to um, election law. And we've heard from two panelists already some very important information and also brainstorming about how uh, transparency and election law might relate to each other. I'm a, a First Amendment specialist rather than an election law specialist. So the part of this that I want to focus on today is um, what the First Amendment says about what the law can can't do uh, with regard to transparency in um, in primarily I'll be talking about campaign finance, but also in some of the um, uh, areas where Professor Hassan mentioned, we might have uh, other types of disclosures, re disclosure requirements that could be related to election law that aren't about campaign finance in particular. Um, and I, I want to, uh, basically the proposition that I'd like to put before this august group of um, election law and First Amendment scholars is uh, that uh, when we're talking about transparency, we're inevitably talking about disclosures. And disclosure ends up being something that the First Amendment has a really hard time with, generally speaking. And um, maybe in a kind of echo of one of the conversations that was going on this morning, you know, query whether that's even particularly the case in the election law context, because, you know, what this, this larger theme that was uncovered this morning is how much is election law um, really of a piece with First Amendment law generally, and how is it, it, how much is it just different, its own thing, even within the body of First Amendment law. So my contention is this is an area, disclosure is an area where the First Amendment already has a lot of problems, um, and then dealing with it within the campaign finance context maybe um, has its own unique challenges. So uh, to lay this out, I want to start at kind of the beginning of disclosure. I'll get to campaign finance and election law eventually. Um, and this is partly for those of you who are in this field to check my work and see if um, the, the premises on which I'm, I'm resting my concern here, whether they hold up. And for those of you uh, students who are maybe newcomers to this area to try to contextualize a little bit some of the conversations um, and, and give a little bit of a primer of what we talk about when we talk about compelled disclosure in the campaign finance context. So um, if, we're, if we're doing our kind of First Amendment taxonomy and we're going all the way back to, you know, this is not the genus, this is not the species. I mean, maybe we're even asking what kingdom are we in here of the First Amendment? Uh, the answer would be when we're talking about any type of transparency and, and required disclosures, we're in compelled speech territory. Um, and you can think about a lot of the time in the First Amendment context, we're talking about restrictions on speech. We're talking about a law that says you can't 
talk about X or you can't share information about X. Uh, we're gonna punish you, you know, we're gonna suspend you student in a public school uh, for saying X or Y. Um, here we're talking about what the government can require someone to say. And um, that has been a tricky area from the very beginning. So uh, the, the case that we start with in talking about that in First Amendment class is West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett from 1943, in which the court, the Supreme Court held that uh, forcing students to say the Pledge of Allegiance on pain of uh, suspension or worse was unconstitutional under the First Amendment. Um, Barnett itself was a tricky case. You might think of all types of compelled disclosures, one that says, I pledge allegiance to this set of ideals that uh, that's really kind of the heart of, of um, First Amendment concerns about compelled speech. Um, but in fact, Barnett uh, completely reversed a uh, decision that the Supreme Court had made in the Gobitis case just three years earlier, where they had upheld exactly the same type of pledge requirements. So from the very beginning, we have this ambivalence about compelled speech. And um, that has continued largely. Um, and, and you could read Barnett as um, setting out a, an idea that kind of compelled speech, uh, compelled speech requirements are just as bad as speech restrictions. And that's a theme that continues, at least in the rhetoric, both of court opinions and of scholarship. Robert Post, for example, has said that there should be symmetry between uh, regulation of speech restrictions under the First Amendment and that of speech compulsions, but there's never really been symmetry. There's never, from the very beginning, there hasn't been symmetry. Um, but we don't have a kind of worked out recognition of, of what that relationship should really look like. So to give an, an example of how it is that we don't have symmetry, you can think people make the uh, people have compelled disclosures they have to make all the time. Um, the the um, the state can't force you to say the pledge, but they can force you to uh, take your math test in first period right after the pledge. And if you don't, you can get an F. And if you know eventually, if your um, if your performance is bad enough, they can put you in another school, and um, possibly even suspend you or or something worse. So there's all sorts of ways in which you know we have to turn in our taxes. We have to come. We have to disclose things to the government all the time. Um, so you could think, well, okay, so disclosures of pure facts, those are different from saying the pledge. Uh, but then it turned out that that immediately itself became a complicated proposition um, with the case NAACP versus Alabama, where Alabama tried to employ its foreign corporations law to compel the NAACP to release lists of its members. So this is a, this is a content neutral law, the foreign corporations law. It doesn't exist for any speech related purpose but it's being used in this particular application, uh, allegedly to uh, um, expose members of the NAACP and potentially to subject them to reprisals by third parties. So the Supreme Court here says, well, okay, if, if, we, if we're talking about compelled disclosures, um, what we're gonna look at is, and this is a test that they, they kind of bring it out, they, they use it in NAACP, but the, the parameters of it, the contours get kind of formed up, uh, firmed up in the rhetoric uh, in later cases. You essentially have an effects test that says if this disclosure requirement imposes a serious burden on a, a group's associational rights, then a court's gonna ask whether uh, that disclosure requirement is narrowly tailored to a compelling state interest. Now, the thing that I wanna pause and emphasize here is, this is the court really having a hard time with compelled disclosure. And one way that you can tell is that they have employed an effects test here where a lot of the rest of First Amendment doctrine is really a purpose-based test. If you think about how they analyze restrictions, speech restrictions, um, both on content-based regulations and in content-neutral regulations, uh, the tests are really focused around the purpose of the law. Uh, Justice Kagan, back when she was a law professor at, at the University of Chicago, made the argument that the content-based apparatus is really ultimately about um, exposing the purpose of a law. And the, um, the content-neutral doctrine is about that basically on its face. Um, it, it asks, well, is the face, uh, is this law facially content-based? If so, kick it over to the content-based 
analysis, if it's neutral on its face, we're going to ask about its justifications. That is, we're going to ask about its purpose. And if those justifications are neutral, then it's going to get a very cursory form of scrutiny. That is, what we really care, care about is what's the, what's the government's purpose behind this law? What they don't ask is, what's the effect of this law on expressive opportunities? And it's probably a good thing that they don't ask that question because as uh, Larry Alexander has said, every law has some effect on speech opportunities. All laws affect speech opportunities. The law that says that you can't drive until you're 16 has an effect on your ability to go to the library and so forth and so on, right? There's, there's always an effect on speech opportunities. But here in the compelled disclosure context, they, they chose to adopt an effects test that makes basically every uh, compelled disclosure that, that falls within this doctrine uh, immediately suspect. You have to ask what's its effects, and you don't really care whether it was driven by a nefarious purpose or not. You're asking just about what the, what the effects are going to be on a given association. Um, you know, one theory for why this happened is that the court really was reluctant to call out the officials in Alabama for their racist application of this content neutral law. That is a law that, you know, a foreign corporations law that has a legitimate purpose outside of um, uh, anything speech related. Um, and, and maybe that's the case, right? But it ends up putting uh, disclosures in their own kind of doctrinal category. So where is campaign finance and all this? It comes on the scene in the 70s. Um, where, you know, first in Buckley versus Vallejo, and, and then in, you know, many, many of the campaign finance cases that we've seen since then, it's not just restrictions of some type, just as in Buckley, it wasn't just uh, the expenditure and contribution restrictions, but also disclosure requirements that are being reviewed uh, by the court. And here too, the, the court doesn't quite know what to make of it. So we've got um, the sort of compelled speech uh, uh, regime of uh, Barnett that's been uh, uh, refined since that case. We've got, you know, what happens if there's a compelled factual disclosure that affects the associational rights of a group. We've got some other uh, uh, doctrines related to compelled disclosures that I'm not going to get into. And then we have, um, the way the court has handled disclosure in a campaign finance context. So in Citizens United, um, the last time that they sort of pronounced in a blanket way about this, uh, Justice Kennedy said that a disclosure requirement in that context has to have a substantial relationship um, with a sufficiently important government interest, uh, which is a different, different standard from what's used in the, the cases that have, uh, the compelled disclosure cases that have kind of come down from NAACP versus Alabama, different, for example, from uh, Dale versus uh, Boy Scouts and other associational rights cases that have, uh, that have come out. And, you know, I'm giving you kind of the doctrinal contours and trying to make the case that the, the court has really not known exactly what to do with this. Um, I think underneath that, or, and, and it, it's constantly refining, right? So you have compelled speech and then you have compelled disclosure and then you have, well, compelled disclosure requirements and campaign finance. And you have some, some other, you know, there's some different campaign disclosure rules with regard to safe commercial speech, for example. Um, and I think they're, they're constantly refining um, partly because um, it's hard to know what to do with disclosure requirements because many of them are plain vanilla, easy peasy. You understand where they come from, why they exist, and we all comply with them without thinking. Um, and sometimes they look really suspicious. NAACP versus Alabama is a time when it looked really suspicious. Um, but the court correct, uh, created a whole doctrine that's really not about let's sniff out what doesn't smell right. Let, it instead said, let's, let's apply this heightened standard to everything. And I think the court doesn't quite know how to handle um, the, the demands of transparency. Um, it's got going kind of this, this fundamental um, difficulty that maybe has been there from the very beginning when you think of someone like Justice Brandeis, who's a very early um, proponent of free speech, but also a very early proponent of, of transparency and sunshine being the best disinfectant. So when you frame disclosing information as implicating someone's freedom of speech rights, uh, you're going to have tensions. And we, we see that up and down the doctrine, um, and, and we see it here in the campaign finance context. Now, I, the, a couple of thoughts I want to leave you with. One is that 
um, as, as my other distinguished uh, colleagues on this panel have, have shown, this is not just about campaign finance disclosure as it exists today. It's about um, following the money more generally. It's about other types of disclosures like disclosure of data collection, the fact of data collection, possibly disclosure of the sources of information that people are using to make a, a, a particular type of comment. So you could imagine, let's not, uh, let's not get rid of false speech, but let's uh, up the ante of forcing people to say where they got their information or provide sources that back up their information. These are disclosures too. And they, they raise contact, they raise questions of, um, would we use the same standard that we use in the campaign finance context, or would we use some of the, one of these other standards um, from other parts of First Amendment law? Would uh, disclosure of data collection be a campaign finance issue, or would that be an issue that would fall under NAACP versus Alabama, for example, or some other doctrine? And this gets us back to the question of how is campaign finance uh, regulation of a part with First Amendment doctrine generally, and how is it different? Um, there was raised at the end of the last panel a question of maybe we will wind up with a special law of, of election speech. I think we already have one, but um, that's maybe something that we can say for the Q&A if we get to that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kendrick. That was also quite interesting and a nice refresher on some First Amendment law for, uh, for some of us. Um, we have a number of questions um, that have been um, posted, um, and so I'm, I'm going to get to those. We have about 15 minutes, um, and I'm going to try to combine, a, there are enough questions that I'm going to try to combine a couple of them to uh, maybe make things um, a little bit more streamlined. <clears throat> so um, one of the questions has to do, this is, I think, initially at least directed to, uh, to Professor Torres Spellacy. Um, is there, you know, it, how how prevalent is the ghost candidate phenomenon? Is it a widespread problem? And then I would tack on to that um, uh, Zachary Tuman's question, um, uh, which is um, uh, that um, the criminal law in this area always works out to seem to be fairly toothless. Um, and um, is, is the idea of turning to the criminal law um, sort of white collar criminalizing or pursuing the white collar angle on this really likely to be fruitful or as Zachary Tuman suggests, is there a way to incentivize good election behavior rather than um, pretend uh, to punish? So I haven't done an, an analysis looking back for ghost candidates, though that'll be my homework for myself uh, this evening. Uh, it's an excellent question. As I said, I've been getting these questions from reporters for at least eight years. And uh, when the Artillas scandal broke, lots of Florida politicians said, ha ha, they finally got caught um, doing what they've been doing for years. So that I need the answers to that question myself for my book. But uh, I think the reason why this was actually prosecuted uh, what was a few things. So the when the Democratic candidate in uh, the 37th district um, lost his seat, he actually said in his concession speech, please look into this. Like he, he basically made a plea, please investigate this. We think that something nefarious happened here. And I think part of what allowed prosecutors to actually look into this case is Frank Artillas in a room full of other people uh, bragged about getting Alex Rodriguez to run as a ghost candidate. So I think without that, you know, excited utterance from Mr. Artillas, this probably would have gone nowhere. And I think in most cases, it's going to be very difficult to prove this type of uh, nefarious plot, which, you know, most people would keep under their hat if they're participating in it. Uh, but I think we actually have to have um, the ability of prosecutors to look into such things, because, you know, in my mind, the voters in this district got boondoggled and tricked, and they don't have the candidate of their choice in Tallahassee right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I have a, another question. I'm gonna sort of try again to work in um, some questions that are pending with a couple of thoughts that I had. Um, Mason Butner asks about micro-targeting. 
um, a question of whether micro-targeting should trigger a review of the court's stance on false political speech. The ability to tailor misinformation for key political populations seems like a much larger threat than the threat of misinformation broadcast generally, say, over TV or radio. Um, I would tack on to that question about uh, micro-targeting a question of my own, which is, um, Professor Hassan, in your presentation, obviously the concern focuses a lot naturally on misinformation and disinformation, but it micro-targeting presumably also allows for good information to be more effectively delivered, that is to say accurate and even voter helpful information. So is there a baby in a bathwater problem um, lurking in this as well? Right, so it's sometimes uh, micro-targeting is defended that, uh, you know, give people what they want to, to know that would be most valuable for them to know. Um, the way the economics is today, um, it wouldn't be that much more expensive to say, target everyone in a particular zip code or a particular congressional district with these ads. The ads are relatively cheap. Um, and so I don't know that, um, so, you know, so you might be providing information that would be less relevant to some people. Maybe they'd get annoyed by that. So maybe that's a reason to allow the micro-targeting. Um, but I think, you know, the some of the problem is not even that the misinformation is in the message itself. Uh, but instead, it is in misrepresentation of who the messenger is. So this is less of a problem with campaigns and more of a problem with outside groups. And someone, I can't remember who it was, referred to this uh, in the first panel, referring to, I think it was Helen Norton, referring to Spencer Overton's work about Russian government agents that posed as Black activists and sent information, you know, don't vote for Hillary Clinton, she's not uh, helping African-Americans. Um, if we had disclosure, at least to take the Ravel and Wood idea, if we had at least disclosure of what ads were being micro-targeted and there was some kind of repository, some way of, of checking these, there would at least be a way of ferreting out those attempts to try to suppress the vote or manipulate opinion in a way that is less draconian than you know, uh, banning particular speech. So I do think that at the very least, disclosure of this kind of activity could be useful. Uh, just because you're targeting one message to one candidate, one, one set of voters, and another message to another, it shouldn't be that you'd be so embarrassed about that message that you wouldn't want people to publicly know that this is what you were saying. And so that would be what the disclosure would get at. Um, the more um, uh, uh, extreme version that would ban the practice entirely depends on the idea that people don't recognize the extent of the, 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 the privacy that they've given up. And it's a kind of autonomy argument. And, and so that is, even if it's truthful information, we're still being manipulated in a way that we may, it's a, it's a more paternalistic argument as I, as I admit in my book, but I do think that it is so much more extreme what we're seeing like the, like the uh, mind reading machine, that there is an argument to be made for simply not allowing tar super targeted messages to go to voters in that way. Does anyone else? want to speak to that uh, question. Part of the question had to do with the idea of possibly um, a reconsideration of the court's position on false political speech more generally. I don't know whether that's something that um, uh, any of you um, wishes to comment on. There was a lot of discussion about that in the last panel. I mean, the only thing I would add is uh, that um, I agree with those. I think it was also, again, Helen Norton who said that a narrowly tailored law targeting who uh, can vote where, when, and why is something that is uh, likely constitutional, uh, but it would only target a small portion of the kind of misinformation and uh, dangerous speech about elections that we see online and elsewhere. Great. One thing that I think sometimes doesn't happen in these panels is, uh, you know, you all speak and then you don't have a chance to speak to each other. So um, perhaps one of you might have a question uh, for uh, one or more of the rest of you. Um, uh, is, that, uh, is that so? Professor Kendrick, did you want to jump in? And then uh, I see Professor Hassan has one as well. Sure. Yes. Um, well, I, I love um, hearing from both of you and have lots and lots of questions, but I think, um, uh, Shara, um, I was wondering about how, how you define a ghost 
candidate or how you think one should define a ghost candidate. So it sounds like the the hook that we that uh, the legal system can agree on here that is problematic is that this person accepted a bribe in order to become a candidate. Um, but let's say you have someone who's relatively low key, low profile, no one's gonna be able to dig up kind of what their political past is. And they have enough money to do this on them on their own that they don't really need it. You know, I'll just sit here on the ballot. I'll get enough signatures. I'm not going to try to win. I'm just going to try to help someone else lose. Um, does this raise questions about we need to build a beefier definition of what a real candidate is, or is that dangerous territory? Oh, it is dangerous territory. And I, it, it's precisely why I didn't get it for eight years in a row when <laughs> his reporters are like, we, there are these bogus candidates like showing up all over Florida. Is this a problem? And I was like, no, this is great. Um, and I think like many areas of both election law and the First Amendment, it's like a, a definitional quagmire. Um, I mean, one of the things that was true of these particular uh, ghost candidates that I referenced um, today is neither of them did any campaigning at all. Zero, zero zip nothing. The, all of these mailers were sent out on their behalf by other parties, but they themselves did nothing. And the Justine character apparently was already planning not just to leave the state, but to leave the nation when she agreed to be a ghost candidate. So, you know, having no intent to stay in the state where you're running for election, that might be an ind indicia of uh, insincerity. Yeah, there is a risk, you know, that Victoria Extern points out in the questions, which is um, that, you know, micro targeting, um, um, not not every candidate that gets small numbers of votes is a ghost candidate or is in it for suspect reasons and often lesser known candidates, small town candidates, candidates who simply want to introduce an issue into the election um, uh, or maybe diversify the, the pool of candidates can also be in there. So it does strike me as fraught broad ground. Um, Professor Hassan, did you want to uh, have a question for one or the other of your peers? Yeah, I, I first I just wanted to say that on the question of ghost candidacies, it seems like the best way to deal with that is through improved disclosure. So if 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 everyone knows that it's Florida Power and Light that's backing these candidates, then that information could be used by journalists to say, you know, why are you getting all of this money from this, you know, and find these people. And as I recall from this reporting, these candidates would literally hide from reporters, which is not the not not the actions that you usually see with candidates. Uh, my question is for Leslie. I, I think. Um, you're certainly right that the way that the court approaches compelled disclosure in the campaign finance context is different than in the other areas, even if the language that's used is the same. And I want to see if you had any thoughts on whether the Supreme Court's opinion in uh, the end of the last term in the Americans for Prosperity Foundation versus Bonta really changes things. But it seems to me that it uh, has redefined exacting scrutiny to be strict scrutiny and made it so you no longer have to show an individualized chill as you would have to in the NAACP versus Alabama situation in order to challenge laws, which suggests that our very basic campaign finance laws could be subject to uh, a, a, um, a constitutional, a more successful constitutional challenges going forward. Yeah, I think it's a great question. What's what are the ramifications of Americans for Prosperity on this whole area of law? And I don't know. I agree with you in in your analysis of of what it did. And you know, I, I guess the the if if I were teaching it, I would say, well, look, this is this is a case that kind of straddles that line between um, kind of regular compelled disclosed uh, or sorry, regular um, compelled disclosure compelled association type cases like NAACP, um, which is, you know, the NAACP case doesn't have anything to do with campaign finance, right? And campaign finance disclosure laws, this is about, you know, disclosing the major donors to an organization um, or, or to, a, um, to a candidate. So, um, you know, you've got uh, disclose, disclosing um, information to organize, about donors to organizations that are politically involved. And then, you know, from there you can go to disclosures to actual candidates. So there's kind of a, it, it, there's a spectrum here. And 
you know, it's, it, it's interesting to see, and it, it's interesting to see how they deal with these sorts of laws. And to me, this does look different. It looks different, for example, from Dovey Reed from now, you know, now it's been upwards of 10 years ago about, um, do, you know, donors to a, to a um, proposition, uh, to a state proposition. I do think Think they're tightening up, you know, whatever the relationship has ever been between exacting scrutiny and strict scrutiny. It seems like exacting is trending stricter. Um, and I, what what the question is for me is, I'm just not sure how much they have all of these other cases along the spectrum in mind when they def, when they decide a particular case. So I think for some of them, they're already unsympathetic to campaign finance related disclosure analysis. They would like that to be tightened up already. What I don't know is, is there a majority of the court that would say, yes, the logic of Americans for prosperity carries over, or would there be ones who would say, whoa, 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 that's, that's not exactly what we meant. You know, I think Justice Kennedy would have said that's not exactly what we meant, but I don't know enough about um, what, what the current makeup of the court would say about that. And this gets back to just kind of the general incoherence of their approach on compelled disclosures. Um, and maybe some of that's natural because lots of types of different disclosure requirements are actually different and are suspect or non-suspect to, to differing degrees. But um, they've had a hard time capturing that intuition in a sort of stable set of doctrine. So but, but I add to that? Uh, so I just wanted to point out that the Supreme Court, when it is dealing with campaign finance disclosures, has had to wrestle with the NAACP uh, line of cases. So they had to wrestle with it in Buckley and they upheld uh, disclosure. They had, to up, they had to wrestle with it in Citizens United and they upheld disclosure. They had to do it in McConnell and they upheld disclosure. So they have had many bites at the apple. And what they come back to is that disclosure and campaign finance is justified by the voter informational interest. So I just wanted to add that into the mix. Although, yes, um, although I will note that there is an interesting question posed in the Q&A um, from an anonymous uh, person, um, sort of calling into question the val the practical value of disclosures, um, whether, you know, maybe we as lawyers think about disclosures as being a kind of uniform good, the question asks, it seems like one of the things that causes issues in our elections is the sheer amount of information. And more disclosure seems like it could only exacerbate that issue rather than solving it. So I don't know whether any of you, just as a final thought, has anything um, to say, uh, you know, sort of to salvage disclosure from this, uh, this uh, uh, query in the, in the, in the q and I, I think the evidence shows, uh, it's kind of ironic that the person was anonymous who asked the question, but uh, I, think, uh, <laughs> uh, I think the evidence shows that voters do uh, as uh, Char talked about, rely on uh, information that comes from disclosure, not necessarily directly. Voters are not pouring through these campaign finance reports like we saw put up on the PowerPoint, but they rely on journalists and others and uh, opposing candidates to find this information, draw connections. So in California, we had a measure on the ballot about a decade ago about whether public utilities could be created to compete with private utilities. And uh, 42 million was spent uh, on the measure in favor and a million against and the thing still lost. And I think the reason it lost was because almost all of the 42 million came from Pacific Gas and Electric, one of the major power, private power companies that didn't want competition. So voters certainly do know how to use the information when it is available to them. Was it during the time of those rolling blackouts when people- It was, it was not, yeah, not too far off from that time. That's right. <laughs> well, I, I'm looking at the clock and I see that we're uh, shortly after two. And so Madeline, I think probably we have reached um, the end of our panel. But um, before I go, I just wanted to once again thank um, uh, the First Amendment Law Review for the opportunity to step in here and um, have a very interesting hour listening to our three distinguished panelists talk about these issues. And thank you very much to the panelists as well. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. I will reiterate that thank you to all of you who just participated in our second panel, our moderator, our panelists. Um, that was really interesting and great conversation to be able to listen in on. So thank you all. Um, we are about to take a short break between now and our third and final panel of the day. 
Um, that will start at 2.15, but before I send you all off on your break, for those of you with your CLE worksheet, the second term you should have under panel two is micro-targeting. So those two terms would be political ads and micro-targeting. Um, all right, we will reconvene here at 2.15. Thank you all.
All right, I think we're ready to get started with our third and final panel of the day. Um, this panel is going to focus on the role of online platforms in reducing election misinformation. Um, kick us off by thanking everyone for being here who's on this panel. Um, our moderator for this panel is Professor David Ardia. Uh, Professor Ardia joined the Carolina Law Faculty in 2011 and serves as the Reef C. Ivy II Excellence Fund term Professor of Law and Faculty Co-Director of the UNC Center for Media Law and Policy. He also holds a secondary appointment at the UNC School of Media and Journalism. His teaching and research interests include constitutional law, media law, internet law, and torts. Professor Arnia is the author of Media and the Law, as well as numerous articles and essays on the First Amendment, privacy, government transparency, and internet law topics. Professor Arnia attended Syracuse University College of Law, where he was the lead articles editor of the Syracuse Law Review and graduated summa cum laude. He also received an LLM from Harvard Law School. After law school, Professor Ardia clerked for Judge Conrad Sear on the United States Court, Court of Appeals for the First Circuit and for Judge Thomas McAvoy on the United States District Court for the Northern District of New York. Professor Ardia practiced law at Williams and Connolly in Washington, DC, where he handled a range of intellectual property and media litigation. While at Williams and Connolly, he also performed pre-publication libel for pre-publication libel review for Newsweek, The National Enquirer, and In Touch Weekly. Before joining Carolina Law, Professor Ardia was a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, where he founded and directed the center's digital media law project. Prior to his time at Harvard, Professor Ardia was assistant counsel at the Washington Post, where he provided pre-publication review and legal advice on First Amendment news gathering, privacy, intellectual property, and general business issues. Professor Ardia is a member of the Online News Association's Legal Advisory Board and the Executive Committee of the Association of American Law School's Mass Communication Law Section, which he chaired in 2013 and 2014. Professor Ardia, thank you so much for being here and moderating this panel, and I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Maddie. Um, and I, I wanna give a shout out to, uh, to Madeline and to Elizabeth Ernest uh, for putting together this absolutely uh, fascinating so far um, uh, symposium. And also note that uh, I've, been, I've been honored to be the faculty advisor for the First Amendment Law Review for about 10 years now. And every year I'm astonished at how much work the students put into planning uh, a symposium. And I have to say this year in particular, the challenges were enormous with uh, the uncertainty over uh, COVID, whether we would be in person, remote, the last minute switch, how we were going to make all of this work. And through all of that, um, Maddie in particular has been absolutely phenomenal, calm, under pressure, dealing with uh, an influx of questions and uncertainty. So thank you both. I mean, I get a chance at the end to thank you for all of uh, um, your work in putting this on. Um, I also want to thank um, Professor Muller for stepping in at the last minute, and Professor Papandrea, um, both of whom did fantastic jobs and really set a high bar for me as being a moderator. Um, and I want to thank uh, Charles Story, who um, none of you get to see, but Charles, in addition to managing all of the IT aspects for, this, for the uh, University of North Carolina School of Law, has also become quite a wizard at putting on uh, Zoom webinars. And uh, it's because of Charles that everything goes so smoothly. Every event that I've been involved with where Charles has been behind the scenes has gone uh, smoothly. And, uh, and thank you for that, Charles. You rarely get a, a thank you um, for all of your hard work. Thank you for, for doing that. So um, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to proceed uh, in the same way that the previous panels have, which is I will introduce each speaker um, right before they speak. And, um, and at the end, once everyone has spoken, my thought was to give the panelists a chance to ask, ask questions of each other, engage in a, a short conversation uh, together. And then uh, I would ask a few questions and then bring in your questions as well. Um, if you do have a question, please put them through in the Q&A tool um, and, uh, and I'll go through them and hopefully um, organize them in such a way that they make sense, but uh, don't be shy. I think you can also do so anonymously if you have a question that you don't want to attach your name to. So um, our first speaker uh, uh, today on the panel is going to be uh, Jasmine McNeely. 
Um, Professor McNeely is an associate professor in the Department of Media Production Management and Technology at the University of Florida College of Journalism and Communication, and also the associate director of the Marion B. Breckner First Amendment Project. Dr. McNeely has written on a remarkably broad set of topics, um, but I want to highlight one recent publication in particular that focused on what she calls dark patterns that she describes as design elements that deliberately obscure, mislead, or coerce um, website visitors into making unintended and possibly harmful choices. Um, Dr. McNeely and a colleague recently launched I Obscura, a web zine intended to be a resource to highlight, educate, and engage practitioners and researchers on dark patterns in industries ranging from financial services and smart home devices to children's technologies. Um, Dr. McNeely holds a JD and a PhD in mass communication from the University of Florida and a Bachelor of Science in both journalism and Afro-American studies from the University of Wisconsin. And we're thrilled to have you here today um, and I'll let you go ahead. Thank you for that uh, really great introduction. Um, and I'm happy to be here when um, I'm on a panel with all these great speakers and just in the company of uh, such great Minds, um, I hopefully you can see the screen, my sharing a PowerPoint. Um, and it's great that uh, Professor Ardia primed you all uh, talking about the I Obscura uh, webzine uh, because I want to talk about dark patterns as campaign uh, deception. So I know this symposium today focuses a lot of lot on misinformation, disinformation, and you know schemes. Um, related to election and or campaign related speech. And I, I wanna continue on in that vein, but from a different angle. And that is from the expression, but expression embodied in design. So design has both the communicative and emotive uh, issues or, or points um, as if we're gonna quote uh, Cohen versus California that are important to people and that make them salient and that communicate different ideas. At the same time, design is or can be used to manipulate people into making decisions that they otherwise would not make. And so what are the ramifications when dark patterns or deceptive design is used in connection to issues that are perhaps even more salient, resonate even more with uh, people than um, whether or not we sign up for a newsletter or not. Um, and when the consequences of those designs are enormous, particularly for certain sex segments of the population who encounter them. So let me give you an example. Um, an example is the Trump campaign. Uh, last year, New York Times broke a story related to the Trump campaign and their use of win red. When Red is a, a fundraising, a, was a campaign election, or is a campaign, an election fundraising platform um, that was used. And they found out that uh, this platform was using design that got way more money from donors than the donors themselves ever could imagine they were gonna donate. Um, and in fact, in connection with that, the Trump campaign had to return almost 10% of uh, the funds that it had collected through that WinRed platform. So what would happen is uh, users would get on and they would encounter, of course, regular texts and regular pictures, as you can imagine, on a campaign website. And then they would come to the portion where there's the ask, right? And the ask was in connection with these yellow boxes. And if you can see on the screen, uh, one box there, notice please first that they're pre-checked um, boxes. And that's really important. And, and one of the boxes says, this is the final month with an election day and we need every patriot stepping up if we're going to win four more years for President Trump. He's revitalizing our economy, restoring law and order, and returning us to American greatness, but he's not done yet. This is your chance. Stand with the president or stand with President Trump and maximize your impact now. And then in a different 
font or not bold, right? There is that make this a weekly recurring donation until a certain point. So, and then under that, there's another uh, similar kind of yellow box with bold text. And again, that donate is in different text, not as emphasized in the design, but uh, donate an additional $100 automatically on a particular date. What, what, these, what this has been called is called a money bomb. And what happened is people were sincerely donating money, but because these boxes were pre-checked they, and they didn't notice it, they were actually making donations far exceeding what they wanted to. So some people have reported making six times the amount of donations that they actually wanted to. Um, some people had to cancel credit cards. Many people contacted their banks and other financial institutions to stop the um, transactions that were occurring on a weekly, sometimes monthly basis. And, you know, just the, as a point of order, is not just the Win Red and the Trump campaign, but Act Blue was also accused of using pre checked boxes and they said that they were phasing out the use of this. But the whole, the, the entire idea is that you have political expression connected with money, but a design that is deceiving people into giving way more money, the thing of value than they would want. And so what is this called? Um, under Brignall, Harry Brignall is the, the uh, UX designer and researcher that coined the term dark patterns. Um, and he has quite a typology of what a dark pattern is and I think the money bomb as used on the Wid Red website could fall into several different uh, um, categories of the typology, one of which is the Roche Motel. And the Roche Motel is, uh, it's very easy to get in, but it's very hard to get out of the interaction or subscription, or in this case, the donation or the, the recurring donations. Also, I would say that this could fall into the bait and switch, which most of us are familiar with, that you're thinking you're getting or giving one thing and you end up getting or giving, in this case, another thing. And also certainly hidden costs. There were fees associated even with uh, people making donations using that WinRed website. And also that when they attempted to get refunds, the they were told that the platform when red was going to keep the processing fees that it had forced or charged them in connection with the deceptive donations in the first place right overall these are dark patterns dark patterns you know basically designs that allow organizations individuals to but organizations to get something out of individuals that <clears throat> they usually would not be able to do without these obscure tactics. <coughs> Pardon me. And <coughs> again, dark patterns are designs. <coughs> Excuse me. They are designs, they are, <clears throat> they are expressive or communicative <clears throat> points that um, some people would say are deserving of First Amendment protection, but <clears throat> they also cause harm. In many cases, as in this case, we're talking about lost money, Sometimes it's lost time or privacy. There's also the emotional manipulation that happens and a infringement on, <coughs> excuse me, on autonomy that happens <coughs> at times. Where is legislation? 
So I'm, you know, there are several pieces of legislation that are <coughs> proposed or used by the states and state AGs have been very aggressive with dark patterns. Um, Colorado passed its Privacy Act last year and they have a specific definition of a dark pattern and it expressly prohibits the use to gain consent, which is a very limited um, definition or targeting of what a dark pattern is or does. Uh, of course, there's ROSCA, which is a federal law, and that's for more online shoppers and their confidence. And this is a, a focused on more transparency. And finally, of course, there's a Detour Act, which has been reproposed in Congress, and it's aimed at large platforms. And um, they're concerned about basically A-B testing, but also other kinds of dark patterns that can manipulate people into doing different things. The problem with these policies is, you know, there are many, quite frankly. One, again, the question of whether or not the First Amendment comes into play and whether or not it's useful for allowing a law that may have uh, touch expressive components. At the same time, we know that fraud and uh, deception are not necessarily protected by the First Amendment, although false speech may be in certain contexts. But there's also the problem with the law that has to do with the threshold problem, the user threshold. Many of the laws that we just saw uh, have a user threshold. Uh, the Detour Act, the federal law, for example, has a user threshold uh, for large platforms. And that is 100 million. That means there has to be at least 100 million users in a 30-day period. That would perhaps not apply to political fundraising platforms. And um, unfortunately, that means that such behavior by when read and act blue, if they were to have continued, would not be prohibited under the law. The other problem is, and a huge problem is the focus on consent. Uh, many of the laws focus on whether or not users can opt in or opt out, or I should say focus on opting out and providing transparency with respect to opting out, instead of focusing on whether or not a user specifically and affirmatively opted in to making donations like this. And finally, they do not provide as much focus on the design implications as they should. Again, we know that design has both communicative and emotive um, implications for those who encounter the messages from design and with politics, even more so the emotive part may mean that people are not paying the due amount of attention that they should. And we already know from several uh, years of privacy and data protection research that people do not always, and, and perhaps they cannot provide the bandwidth to protect themselves from the kind of manipulation um, and deception that happens on platforms not even talking about politically oriented or political fundraising cap platforms. And therefore, the law must do something in respect to uh, dark patterns as a general matter, but specifically also in an era where uh, dark patterns are being used for political gain and political fundraising. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, so uh, my thought is that um, uh, we'll go through the, the each of the panels. I think I mentioned panelists before, and then we'll talk afterwards. But um, but I'm hoping that um, you all in the audience can start sending questions as they come up. Um, you don't need to wait till the end. And um, if you have one that comes up that uh, that's relevant to the to the question the, the Panel, panelists um, discussion at the moment. Um, I'll cue that up so we can get right to it. So uh, our next panelist is um, Professor Robert Yablon uh, 
Professor Raban is an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin Law School, where he teaches civil procedure, federal jurisdiction, and the law of democracy. Um, he also directs the law school's state democracy research initiative. Um, and his research interests include political and election law, constitutional law, federal courts, and statutory interpretation. Um, Professor Yablon received his bachelor's degree in economics and political science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and his master's degree in social policy from the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He then earned a JD at Yale Law School. Following law school, he served as a law clerk for Judge William Fletcher of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and for U.S. Supreme Court Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor. Um, and since Professor Papandrea talked about teaching awards, uh, crowed about teaching awards during her panel, I want to highlight that the UW Law students honored Professor Yablon with the Classroom Teacher of the Year Award in 2018. And in 2019, he received the University Distinguished Teaching Award. So look forward to, uh, to hearing from Professor Yablon, who can take it over now. Well, thank you, David, for that overly generous introduction. It's, uh, I, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you to Madeline and all the folks at the First Amendment Law Review and UNC for uh, all of their efforts. Uh, you know, I only wish that we could all be together um, in person. It is um, fun for me to get to have an opportunity to think about these issues of election related speech and misinformation and campaign related regulation. These are obviously hugely consequential issues, but like a lot of other folks who focus on election law, a lot of my bandwidth in recent months has been consumed by the redistricting cycle and unfolding developments related to voting rights. Um, and so uh, I haven't had as much time to think about these issues as, um, as I'd like. And I should, uh, at the outset, probably offer some caveats. I mean, I don't really consider myself to be someone whose expertise is in law and technology, who has any particular insight into uh, into social media platforms generally. Really, I'm I'm more coming at this from someone who thinks about the structure uh, and the health of democratic institutions. And uh, so, with that in mind, you know, I'll offer a few preliminary points about maybe the nature of the problem that we're discussing. And then um, I, I really wanna offer what I think is just one um, big picture point about how platforms might want to approach the problem of misinformation. And hopefully I'm not zooming out too far. I'm not planning to make any specific policy suggestions, but instead to make a broader point about, about process. So the, the title of this panel is um, the role of online platforms in reducing election misinformation. And so um, I'll just note, uh, by way of preliminaries, a couple of thoughts about the title of this panel. One is, um, I appreciate, I guess, that um, it is uh, optimistic and to some extent aspirational. Um, since if we think about the role of online platforms in recent years, we don't really think of them as reducing election misinformation, but rather as a descriptive matter, we think of them uh, as being responsible for proliferating and amplifying a lot of misinformation. Uh, and in particular, misinformation that can do democratic harm. Uh, and in this morning's panel, I thought that Professor Bill Marshall in particular um, uh, was really helpful articulating the multiple ways in which um, misinformation might do those harms. Well, the problem of misinformation, of course, is one that long predates platforms and social media, but I think you know, we can all think of the various features of platforms um, that, that in a sense have created a perfect storm for the spread of misinformation, the high velocity at which misinformation can spread on platforms, the algorithms that seem to incentivize and reward divisive content, the ability of, uh, uh, to target messages to particular subpopulations, uh, and the nearly costless ability of, uh, of people who uh, to come together and be uh, radicalized. And I, and I think that, you know, you could probably add more to that list. So, um, you know, that's, uh, so I, I like the idea that we're thinking about the role of platforms in solving this problem, but of course it's a problem it, to a large extent of their own creation. Um, secondly, I'd say that the title of the panel, I think uh, takes as an implicit presumption that government is likely to be able to provide at best only partial answers to issues related to misinformation uh, for you know, several different reasons. For one thing, the law on the, on the books as it now exists is quite limited. It largely predates uh, the, the rise of social media platforms. Um, it's difficult in our current political environment to pass new laws, uh, especially at the federal level. And um, to the extent that we were able to pass such laws, those laws are going to be substantially constrained by First Amendment doctrine. And we've heard a lot about that already 
today. Um, I mean, at the very beginning of the day, we heard from Commissioner Broussard uh, that the FEC has concluded that it lacks jurisdiction over the content moderation decisions of social media platforms. Uh, she talked about how maybe they do have uh, more that they can do with respect to micro-targeting and false information in political ads. Um, but of course, the commission is structured in a way that it is often um, deadlocking and uh, is unable to make much headway. Um, I, I did want to just um, give a shout out to what I heard from um, Evan Ringel this morning about the range of state laws that are out there regulating false political speech. Uh, as someone who now is the director of, uh, of a state democracy research uh, initiative, I uh, appreciate always when people are uh, not forgetting ab about states. And uh, and so there is some that might not be happening at the federal level that is at the state level, but again, uh, highly constrained by the First Amendment, not completely. Um, and I thought it was helpful this morning to hear, um, you know, I think Professor uh, Norton referred to it as a continuum of constitutional difficulty. There might be some areas uh, in which the government um, would be able to do more without running afoul of the First Amendment. But of course, um, there are major limits. So in part because of those limits, it's natural to turn to platforms themselves which are not similarly constrained by the First Amendment or by political gridlock and to think about what role um, they can and should play in regulating misinformation. And, uh, and, and these social media companies, um, although it might not be something that in their early days they gave much thought to, they found themselves increasingly involved in content, uh, content moderation decisions and in setting rules of engagement for uh, users on their platforms uh, in you know, realms that go far beyond just misinformation. Um, and they have an increasing array of policies and increasingly elaborate systems uh, of enforcement and governance. Um, and they are making everyday content-based judgments that go well beyond what any uh, government actor could do within the confines of the First Amendment. Uh, and, you know, just by way of example, um, you know, you can consider what uh, platforms did in the run-up to the 2020 election with respect to elect ads. Um, they made a variety of policy choices, uh, really a spectrum. Uh, on one hand, Twitter said uh, before the election that it was not going to run any paid political ads whatsoever. Um, Facebook, on the other hand, not only allowed such ads, but actually exempted them from its normal fact-checking processes that it applies to other types of paid communications. Google was a little bit more on the Facebook end of the spectrum, term, but um, it, it, it did impose at least some limits on micro-targeting and a few other things. And uh, as they were doing this, um, these platforms were also facing the same kinds of difficult line drawing questions that public regulators face. Uh, it, for example, what counts as electoral political content and what does not? And in, in a way, one lesson for these platforms was that it was hard for them to do anything right in the eyes of the public. You know, Twitter was criticized uh, by many for disallowing ads. Facebook was criticized for not doing enough to address uh, false ads. And um, you know, there there was a range of perspective on what the right answer for these plat for, uh, for the platforms was. Uh, and you know, beyond these ads, so if we now are thinking about broader issues of misinformation that might come not just from advertising, but also from organic content, uh, the platforms are gonna face easy questions and hard ones. And they're probably going to have some solutions that are easy solutions and others that would be much more difficult. And again, I think that uh, folks earlier today, uh, Helen Norton, Bill Marshall, others um, very astutely highlighted um, that this is, this is part of the nature of uh, of misinformation. You know, we sometimes have objective misrepresentations that we can all pretty much uh, agree are problematic and might be addressed fairly easily. Um, misrepresentations of identity, misrepresentations about voting uh, procedures. Um, you know, there, there might be uh, steps that we can take without too much trouble to address those. But when we think about the problem of misinformation, we're often thinking about something broader. Uh, and, and then it becomes so much more difficult to address the line drawing challenges. Uh, you know, just to give you two quick concrete examples that uh, are not original to me by any means. But you know, first, if you think about parody, um, you know, the, this is the onion problem. People may disseminate falsehoods uh, for laughs, not intending that they be believed. But what if they are believed? You know, how, if at all, should that be regulated? Are we more worried about the intent of the speaker in that situation or the experience of the listener? Um, second, you know, just going to uh, the, the range of falsehoods to um, uh, truth to falsehoods, you know, you can think of hyperbole and opinion uh, and what uh, organizations like PolitiFact confront when they are trying to assess um, fact, uh, fact and fiction. They don't just have an on off switch. This is min misinformation and this isn't. They have categories like half truth, mostly false, pants on fire 
well, which of those categories are the ones that um, social media companies ought to be um, most concerned about and regulate? I mean, obviously you might think pants on fire is the most problematic, but is that the only category that they ought to deal with? So as uh, social media platforms are making these decisions as self-regulators, they face major credibility problems and, uh, and questionable incentives as they seek to manage these problems, problems that again, largely are problems of their own creations based on practices uh, that they have chosen in part because of their profitability. Um, and so one mechanism that, uh, that Facebook at least has, um, has really taken the furthest steps with is to work with intermediaries. Uh, you know, that they have tried to insulate themselves from some of these decisions. The Facebook Oversight Board, uh, of course, is a prominent example here. Uh, you know, it, there were 20 founding members of this board, um, a diverse group of thoughtful, accomplished experts that are now officially the final appellate body for content moderation on Facebook. And they also can make policy recommendations to Facebook, sort of advisory opinions, although they don't actually get to make uh, policies for the company. And you know, I think that this kind of mechanism does potentially have value for both uh, companies and their users. Uh, you know, it can be helpful for the company to insulate them uh, to some extent from uh, these kinds of decisions. But it also does force the company to have to defend those decisions, provides an independent layer of accountability, um, maybe creates a little bit more transparency in the company's decision-making processes and possibly incentivizes more careful reasoned decisions in the first place. Uh, the most prominent decision that we've seen from the oversight board was uh, involve Facebook's decision to ban Trump from its platform after January 6th. And the oversight board upheld that suspension um, for violating the platform's community standards. But it concluded that um, Facebook um, erred by making the suspension indefinite, that that wasn't supported by the community standards and was, would, uh, was at odds with principles of free expression. Well, um, you know, what, what, does that, what does that experience suggest? Well, the oversight board itself is probably not an answer for misinformation. I recently heard one of its co-chairs, uh, Jamal Green, basically say that flat out, that the misinformation is not a problem that the oversight board is well equipped to address. Um, and, and instead, you know, it is more playing this adjudicative role. And, and so that's where, you know, uh, my, my sort of takeaway last point here is that I, I want us to consider for a second you know, what is um, the oversight board doing when it's enforcing community standards? Um, you know, what, what are the nature of these community standards? Where do they come from and who creates them? Uh, the fact that they're called community standards suggests that they're there to regulate the community, but they might also suggest that they are set by the community, although that's not true in any real sense. I mean, Facebook says that uh, the standards are based on feedback from the community, the advice of experts, in fields such as technology, public safety, and human rights. But really, these are rules that the company is creating internally through top-down judgments by tech industry elites. And they uh, are, in that sense, quite paternalistic. Um, users and the broader public have few direct mechanisms actually to shape these policies themselves. And of course, there's real irony here, since the platforms conceive of themselves as empowering individuals and enhancing uh, their power and autonomy. And, and yet, individuals uh, are not empowered by the platforms to play an active role in deciding on what these policies are. Um, you know, when we think of the work of, so, you know, the oversight board is now thought about as the Supreme Court of Facebook. Well, when we think about conventional courts applying and reviewing laws in this country, those are laws that are the product of democratic processes. Um, well, the uh, community standards, the rules that are being enforced by the oversight board are not uh, at all. And so it just seems to me that the same insight that led Facebook to create the oversight board might suggest that it also um, should create other independent um, participatory mechanisms um, to help decide what uh, its rules uh, should be on misinformation and maybe other topics as well. And, and to be clear, I'm not suggesting that we ought to be inviting public votes on things like who should be suspended from the platform. Instead, what I'm contemplating is broader involvement in the creation of the ground rules. Uh, for these platforms, which seems consistent with the original democratic promise uh, that these platforms made. And, you know, I uh, am not going to offer any specific structural suggestions here, although I realize that the devil would certainly be in the details. Uh, but, you know, you can think of analogies both to legislative bodies or even to um, citizen juries. And uh, if you created these bodies, there might be opportunities over time for dialogue between the work that they would do in terms of setting policy uh, and the work of the oversight board uh, as experts. You know? So um, there might be an appropriate uh, role for both. 
So um, again, I, I'm maybe not giving any helpful answers to what directly should be done about misinformation, but I'm suggesting just uh, that maybe as a conceptual framework for orienting our thinking about how platforms should be setting mechanisms for uh, th that affect uh, our democracy, that maybe there ought to be a little bit more democracy going into those decisions. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Great, thank you, Robert. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Nima uh, Guliani. And Nima, am I saying your last name correctly? I want to avoid pronouncing it in the same way that the former mayor of New York pronounces his last name. You pronounced it right and it's much appreciated. <laughs> Great. So um, uh, Ms. Gulani uh, is head of national security, democracy and civil rights uh, policy Americas for Twitter. In this position, she focuses on public policy issues related to US elections, civil rights and national security issues. Um, all of the easy issues the company faces, I guess. Um, prior to joining Twitter, she was senior legislative counsel at the uh, American Civil Liberties Union, where she was lead policy counsel and lobbyist on surveillance and technology issues. Before her time at the ACLU, she was special counsel to the Department of Homeland Security, where she assisted with the management of department-wide initiatives related to counterterrorism, international partnerships to combat trafficking, and civil rights and civil liberties, among other projects. Uh, Ms. Guliani, holds a JD from Harvard Law School and a BA from Brown University in international relations with a focus on global security. Her bio on LinkedIn refers to her as a quote unquote media savvy lawyer and national strategist dedicated to finding solutions to hard policy problems without sacrificing civil liberties. Sounds like that's exactly the kind of person who needs to be in her position at Twitter. And I'm also thrilled to say that she is currently teaching a class at the UNC School of Law on technology and civil rights this semester, which I hope turns into a regular gig. So go ahead, I'll let you take it from here. Sure, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And um, thank you for all of the people who put the work in to make the symposium happen. I know it's a lot of work and particularly challenging in these circumstances, um, but I think these are really important conversations and I'm glad we're having them. So I think that we've we've heard from you know both in this panel and some of the previous ones a lot of legitimate concerns raised about the spread of election related misinformation, um, particularly misinformation that could lead to voter suppression. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the regulatory proposals um, that have been put out there, um, and more importantly, talk about some of the implications for those proposals. Um, so just two in particular that I'd like to focus on that I think have sort of risen to the top of, of many um, legislators' agendas um, is one, this idea that we should increase liability or even criminality for platforms um, that host certain types of election-related speech that's considered concerning. Um, this often comes in the form of um, liability carve-outs to Section 230. Um, that's Section 230, as, as many of you may have heard in the news and elsewhere, um, has become a hot topic on the Hill. Um, it's a provision that you know, broadly provides um, certain liability protections um, for platforms for the hosting of speech. Um, the other proposal that I think has also gained some traction is the creation and proposal that we should have regimes um, that essentially allow the government to identify certain categories of legal of content that's deemed to be illegal and provide notice to platforms and say, here's something we've deemed to be illegal, you should take this down. Um, generally, there's penalties associated with failure to act or failure to act in a reasonable time frame. And so, you know, the goals, I think, of these proposals are laudable. You know, I think people rightfully want to address what they see as an emerging harm and rightfully want to address um, what they see as a place where the law has really lagged behind some of the harms that we're seeing every day. Um, and a lot of experts, I think, have written extensively about these solutions on both sides, right? Talking about why they might be a good idea, talking about some of the, the speech and other downsides with sort of putting them in place. And so my goal today is not necessarily to rehash the debate um, on, on these proposals about whether they're a good idea, whether they're a bad idea, and whether they'll lead to greater suppression of speech in the United States, um, but rather talk about what I think is often an overlooked component when we're having this debate, and that's the global implications of putting in place these regimes in the United, in the US. Basically, what could this mean um, for the world writ large, um, including in other countries that access and use services that are provided by US companies? Um, so I think I'll start by maybe talking a little bit about what I sort of see as the global context and, and where we are um, when it comes to online internet freedom. 
Um, and then discuss maybe some considerations we might wanna take into account if we go down the road of you know, supporting regulations that would have greater impact on election related speech online. What are the, some of the considerations we would wanna take into account to mitigate what could be negative broader global human rights implications and free expression implications. So, you know, before we talk about sort of some of the considerations and, and what regulation should look like, I think it's important to understand some sort of key facets of, of the global context we're all operating in. Um, so first, we're in a climate of declining online internet freedom. Um, freedom House, which is an NGO that tracks um, global developments, um, has documented a decline in internet freedom for the 11th year in a row. Um, COVID in many parts of the world exacerbated some of these existing problems. Um, so we're at a place where, you know, the dominoes are either starting to fall or continuing to fall, but we haven't really seen sort of um, a push back in the other direction. Um, in the last year alone, what are some of the things we've seen? We've seen internet shutdowns um, in, you know, over 20 countries. Um, we've seen blocking of specific services. Um, we've had more individuals arrested for nonviolent political, social, religious speech than ever before. Um, and we've also seen a greater push to fragment the internet. So that's come in the form of data localization laws um, where countries seek to sort of house data within their borders to facilitate potentially access and privacy incursions. Um, it's also, you know, through, through regulations like content regulations, which would seek to fragment the internet and potentially deny access to certain types of speech um, for large categories of, of locations or individuals in particular countries. So all of this data that, um, that has been tracked really suggests that we're in a very precarious place when it comes to online internet freedom. Um, and I think it suggests that the U.S. Um, should be considering how to sort of switch this trend and what role they can play um, in promoting broader internet freedoms um, and considering the way their legislation could sort of have a secondary impact on this, this larger global phenomenon, the larger global debates. So the second thing I think it's really important to understand about the global context is um, whatever regulations that we adopt in the US as it relates to online election related speech, I think have a good chance of being replicated in some form in countries around the world and in countries around the world that look very different than the US in terms of their judicial systems, their rule of law challenges, et cetera. Um, this could happen in the form of trade agreements. Obviously, if the US decides to sort of actively try to press for replication of its laws. Um, but I think more concretely, it could also happen in some sort of form of soft, what I think of as like soft power, right? Um, the inability of the US to really object to bad regulatory regimes because they've adopted the same ones or other countries sort of looking to the US and, and mimicking the laws it has. Um, that's not to say that people aren't looking at other countries' regimes. Obviously, the EU um, is out there and in many cases has, is more forward-leaning in on tech regulation than the U.S. is. Um, but it's all to say that I think at a practical level, um, what we're talking about in many cases is regulation of U.S. companies, um, and the U.S. still sort of has a lot of influence in this area. So given kind of that reality, which is that we have to be cognizant of online internet speech and the declines we're facing, and we're likely to sort of see replication of what the US does. Um, I think we have to sort of be cognizant of what we might wanna build into any US approach to ensure that it doesn't become a catalyst for greater declines in online freedom around the world. Um, so what are some of the things that, that I think, you know, would be key to consider? Um, the first is to the extent we're gonna go down the road of designating certain types of speech as illegal, right? and in creating mechanisms that either force um, or create greater liability for platforms to, to take action on that kind of speech. I think we wanna make sure that whatever definitions we're using are rooted in common definitions under human rights law. I say that because I think the last thing we want is a US law being used as a model um, in other countries to designate other types and wider categories of speech as illegal, right? So we don't want replication of the US law to lead to greater censorship um, in regimes around the world, including in places where I think, you know, free speech is so vital to um, democratic health. Um, so one of the things I think we have to do along with this is to the extent that we're going to rely on sort of these common definitions um, in, in human rights law, um, is to make sure that we're also investing in the multilateral efforts that really create commonality and principles um, and create commonality um, that shore up these definitions to ensure um, that other countries don't, don't sort of model, the, model laws in similar ways, um, but in ways that actually target 
what, what is important speech that, that should be hosted online. Um, the second thing, and this consideration I think is perhaps probably the most important, is I think that whatever approach we adopt in the US, we have to ensure that it has the highest due process protections. Um, and there's a little bit of tension here, right? You know, sometimes greater due process leads to reduced speed. Um, and in, in the election context and the harm context, sometimes I think there are concerns about how much process you really allow. Um, but the reality is that in many countries that are gonna look to the US, um, there are lots of rule of law concerns um, and there may be greater challenges within their judicial systems. Um, and so what are the things that we wanna avoid? Um, for example, let's say we're in a regime where the government can request the removal of illegal content. Um, what happens if the government gets it wrong? What happens if they deliberately get it wrong because they're motivated, motivated by political purposes? Um, who gets to challenge that, those errors? Um, how does an anonymous user challenge those errors? Um, how do we actually mitigate against the practical reality that some people have access to the courts because they have money and can afford legal representation and some people can't? And so I think that those are, those are really questions we have to answer. Um, and I think that if we look to other contexts, we often see misapplication of, of laws that seem um, laudable on their face, um, but they really are ultimately used to target journalists, human rights defenders, everyday people in ways that um, are concerning. Um, terrorism laws, if we sort of look back at sort of the, the growth in anti-terrorism laws are a good example. Um, around the world, including in places like Turkey, when we see rise in the jailing of journalists, often what we're relying on are anti-terrorism laws um, that have been morphed and used for political purposes. Um, due process doesn't eliminate those risks, um, but it can go a long way to sort of mitigating them. Um, and then the last point I'll, I'll highlight is um, really a greater consideration of the secondary effects of liability. Um, liability, I think, has become one of those things that has, has risen to the top in the U.S. debate. But the reality is, is that increased liability and increased costs can often encourage um, the private sector to exit certain, um, certain markets or to not host certain types of speech. Um, that might mean not entering kind of maybe a new market where there are, are less customers or users, um, but high liability risks. Um, it could also mean just not hosting, you know, large amounts of content. Um, and we've actually seen that in the U.S. in other contexts um, with SESTA-FOSTA, um, which is a law that created liability um, for laws, um, liability um, exemptions um, for laws aimed at combating human trafficking. Um, again, this were the people who were pushing these proposals, I think, had very laudable goals. They wanted to address a rise in concerning content related to human trafficking online. Um, the secondary result of that and an unintended consequence of that, though, was that we saw large swaths of legal speech disappear. Um, in, particularly, in particular, the LGBTQ community um, talked about um, loss of sort of areas where they could host speech. Um, the sex worker community, which had talked about the value of um, the Internet being a place where people could um, you know, share information about health and how to keep themselves safe, often found um, you know, web pages sort of taken down or um, to disappear altogether. Um, and so I think we just have to be cognizant of, of the, the market effects of, of some of those liability proposals. Um, so where does this all leave that? I don't purport to have all the answers, um, which I know is probably frustrating for us all. Um, but I think one of the, the fundamental questions we have to ask is, you know, outside of online content regulation, are there better ways to achieve our goals? Are there better ways to achieve the goals of addressing misinformation, of dealing with sort of the challenges related to voter suppression and, and sort of the bleeding of some of those practices online. Um, and so I guess what I would sort of put forward in sort of closing thoughts is, I think we have to consider dynamic solutions that get ahead of the problem. Um, this after the fact content moderation in some ways is, is almost an old model um, of how we should um, address concerns. Um, and I think we should think more broadly about how we incentivize investments in voter education and things like media literacy ensuring up democratic practices and, and voting um, in democratic institutions. Um, I also think it means exploring solu solutions that focus not necessarily on content of the speech, but what many of the other panelists have rightly raised, which is questions about algorithmic amplification and the modes in which online platforms operate that's sort of separate and apart from the actual content of the speech. Um, these are obviously more complex solutions, but I think that they might tackle the problem while avoiding 
some of the real consequences and harms globally that would come um, in, in a place where the US chooses to sort of have a more aggressive posture towards regulating online speech. Um, so I guess I'll stop there. I look forward to sort of the discussion and hearing the rest of the presentations. Great, thank you, Nima. So uh, our next speaker is um, uh, Brenda Reddick Smalls. Professor Smalls is a professor of law at NC Central School of Law. Uh, prior to joining NC Central, she practiced law as a litigator for over 30 years, specializing in complex litigation, juvenile law, education law, civil liberties, voting rights, municipal law, and commercial transactions. Uh, Professor Reddick Smalls served as executive director of the South Carolina Conference of Branches of the NAACP from 1997 to 98, when she, where she was responsible for statewide litigation involving reapportionment, voting rights, and civil rights impact strategies. In 1993, she received the Mo Jessica Simpkins Flame of Justice Award for her advocacy on behalf of women and children. Professor Reddick Smalls has published extensively in the intellectual property field, particularly with regard to the distribution and allocation of resources and the intersection of social policy, technology, and intellectual property law. And I noticed a consistent theme throughout all of her work is civil rights, civil liberties, and social justice. Professor Reddick Smalls graduated from Brown University with a joint degree in English American Literature and Economics. She obtained her Juris Doctor from Georgetown University School of Law and a Master's of Laws in intellectual property from Franklin Pierce Law Center, now the University of New Hampshire School of Law. So welcome, uh, Professor Reddick Smalls. I'll let you take it from here. You are on mute. Can I unmute? Yes, good afternoon. Thank you, David. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, the First Amendment Review Symposium. Appreciate it. I have been last before, so I am going to make this as brief as possible for everyone. Full disclosure, uh, as David said, I was a litigator. So I came to academia 15 years ago late. Uh, not quite 30 years, David, but I saw the effects of laws on the ground, voting rights litigation and civil rights litigation. So where do we start? when we're talking about the dark web. We start with what does the First Amendment mean on the ground? What does it mean when you're out here trying to vote and someone gives you misinformation, disinformation, or moves the voting booths and tells you that the polls are somewhere else? So, next slide. Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act gives, as we all know, this sort of shield for internet service providers, section 230. What it does is gives to the international service providers this sort of get out of jail free card, right? So you can't treat them as the publisher of this content if someone else does it, even if they repost it, as long as they do certain things in good faith. Right? So they are protected against a whole range of laws, invasion of privacy, other issues, right? So they can't be treated as the publisher of that information. Problem there. There we have a problem right there because they can be used by those who spread misinformation, disinformation, such as Russia, such as Russia and such as other groups. I'm not even going to touch on the groups here yet, but Russia had had a campaign called the Gerasimo campaign, which was designed to sow discord using the internet active internet service providers where they could post false information, and they had a triad of goals, which was mainly using paid advertisement, fake news, and divisive propaganda to divide the American public. Okay, so we've got Section 230. What does it do? It provides immunity. ISP providers, information service providers, they get to decide whether to remove or restrict content which is excessively violent or otherwise objectionable, even if the content is constitutionally protected, which means with their oversight board, as the other speaker says, they get to be the content police for what's on the internet. All right, so we've got a young man looking on the internet, looking at ISPs. ISPs or platform providers could be on the left, could be on the right. Again, what does that do for the little guy on the ground? Psychologic 
uh, warfare is being produced by sometimes both sides. Next slide. Because the information that you get is the information that you are like, the first information that you are likely to view if it's in your tribe as true. Right? Whether or not someone else is using the ISP, you are likely to view this as the truth. And it can be posted, reposted, retweeted, retweeted. And what's the goal here? So next slide will show that sometimes the internet service provider can get it right. But what is otherwise objectionable under our First Amendment? Right? Again, I say as a litigator, under our First Amendment, can't just calling me a name that's objectionable. Do I get to push back against you? It's objectionable, but is it a First Amendment violation? We have to look at the content. Content, characterization, and context. C, C, C. When you litigate, right, and you walk into the courtroom, you've got an objective there. And your objective is to get over the hill. Next slide. It may, the law may not go with you, right? Because you are pushing back against something for your client. 230C2 gives pure protection to the internet service providers. I'm not sure where else in the American litigation regimes that we operate under do we have any entity as large as Facebook with 22 billion right, clients worldwide on certain tweets, I don't think we have any other entity that is so unregulated that gets to deem how we respond, right? So maybe I'm not object, I don't object to the, the N word, but Facebook gets to take it down if there's a discourse about it. Facebook gets to be the arbiter under this of what's objectionable in our society. They deem equals little to no regulation. I don't have the answer, next slide for it, but I do know that the law has kind of carved out certain areas that the internet service providers don't fit in, right? I argue that the internet service providers are a hybrid of commercial speech, right? Providers, that they are advertisers, they're marketers, that they get to do certain things that they're not as protected as others are. The First Amendment does not protect civil liabilities against an entity. Think about New York Times. First Amendment does not protect prohibitions on compensa compensation. Son of Sam. The First Amendment does not protect incitement of imminent illegal activity. This one is the problem and problematic for those folk on the ground, right? Fighting words doesn't protect obscenity, truth threats, child pornography. But it does protect different viewpoints. Do we really want the government coming in saying to us, oh, you know, those words are such that you can't ever use them, right? We don't like those words. When you think about the court, United States v. Doe, they struck down as, over, as overbroad, right, uh, on the grounds of viewpoint right? Discrimination, where the, the school in Michigan had a hate speech code, which prohibited stigmatizing words, right? So we know that the First Amendment does protect us from government overreach, but what about ISPs? And where do, where do they fit in here? Again, I contend that they are the purveyors of incitement sometimes of imminent illegal activity. We all know from Brandenburg, next slide, Brandenburg v. Ohio, mere advocacy is not enough. If you advocate mere, right, your unlawful conduct, not enough, right? But we have to again go back to content, commercial speech and political speech. Political speech is the core. Commercial speech, lesser protection. What about the space? The, the Supreme Court has not dealt with context. Why do I raise this as a litigator? One of the cases that I was brought into were two young white males. They had tied young African-American kids to a tree and took pot shots at them, Clarendon County. And they didn't kill them, but they shot them and wounded them. They were exhorted to do so by the KKK, the Grand Dragon. This is in Columbia, South Carolina. Next slide. Now, that was an exhortation of an imminent illegal conduct, but they weren't touched, the old Grand Dragons, just the young white males. Commercial speech, right? Now, how do I get from there to commercial speech? The internet 
pervades that kind of exhortation to violence, imminent conduct, right? The ISPs, I believe, act as advertisers, and they should be considered in the context of commercial speech. Our next slide here. The context, right? So why? Why do I say that? Advertisers engage in selective perception, platform filtering. They expose their viewers to information where they are told they're right. You're a good guy. You're a good woman. You buy coach bags. Look at these shoes, Prada. You are in a place where it's safe and you believe what everyone else believes. And the platform filters targeting certain people. So we have people who come out, they look for journalists, civil society leaders, political candidates, public officials, celebrities. They want these folks, next slide, to ret retweet. They want this. So voting, if you retweet a falsehood about voting, that the voting booth is, is changed, or that you shouldn't go and vote, or that the people who are controlling the elections are crooks, right? Voting is protected, but voting is now running into the First Amendment. And what are all these laws about that's coming out? Fraud, fraud, right? So we got to protect the integrity of the vote. Suppose that is a lie. Suppose like the two young men who were in the back of the federal courthouse and who were brought in in leg irons and chains said, we were told that they were going to all rise up and kill us. That was their statement. Young guys, right? But now we've got the internet. Next slide. Next slide. Internet is purveying misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation. So we, we were talking about how do we control all of this, right? Misinformation. I think you've got some real First Amendment protections here, right? It's spread regardless of its intent to mislead. Like a lot of young people said, well, you know, if you take the COVID vaccine, they've got magnets in there, and those magnets can, can attract a fork, and we've got people who, you know, the persons who created all of this, all they want to do is to be able to track us. Misinformation, okay? Ignorance combined, right? Disinformation is false information deliberately and often covertly spread as by the planting of rumors in order to influence public opinion or obscure the truth. Next slide. Commercial, commercial, right? Commercial speech is not protected when falsehoods are uttered. Some people believe the falsehood. Some people believe that whatever is being said in their tribe is true. Next slide. This is the young man on the left. Some may recognize Dylan Ruth. You go down the wormhole and you look for your tribe. And if you are being manipulated, such as by Russian intelligence, the IRA, which in Russia was designed to sow discord in America, designed to create div divisive propaganda. If you do that, right, if you are there, right, then you are looking at disinformation. Now, maybe the government can't come in and regulate it or should not, but should the ISPs be allowed to decide what's true and not, what's offensive and not, what should be taken down or not. As someone who's on the ground, and I heard a lot of the panelists speaking earlier today, is some, that they were also litigators, trying to hold, right, someone who has done something wrong criminally, you've got a high burden. But we're talking about the First Amendment and strict scrutiny. Another high burden. Do we just throw up our hands and say disinformation and misinformation can continue to propagate because there's nothing we can do about it? So legislators, how many of them get the disinformation and are quick to put that inside of, oh, now these are laws on the right, all the laws that were created to or designed to eliminate fraud in our election cycle based on many of them when you read the reports on what they are arguing about on the floor of their legislators legislatures where is the fraud but they have created these voter laws next slide and so uh keep going they know about alt right and all tech platforms you can next slide it's user generated on social media but this is not totally political speech 
this, the internet, these ISP programs are not true pure media companies. The Supreme Court has identified social media versus, uh, I'm sorry, broadcast media and print media, but they have yet to address in a meaningful form internet. It certainly wasn't wasn't created at the time the drafters created the First Amendment. It is not the equivalent of print media and broadcast media. And so when we are dealing with, next slide, the bottom line result, right, on the ground when something harmful and hurtful happens to individuals, right, where the First Amendment has allowed people to exhort, right, imminent, imminent illegal conduct, how can we throw our hands up and say, well, we really don't want to come in and regulate because we don't want the government to overreach? So as that, last slide, as that of the people who were killed in Mother Emanuel Baptist Church, who, who where the gentleman walked in and shot them and said later, I, I'm, I'm on these posts which have all been taken down. I was exhorted to do this, right? Ask them about First Amendment protections. And so my goal as a professor to my students is to say drill deeper. The easy answer isn't on the surface that First Amendment, we're such a grand and glorious country that it protects everything. Look at First Amendment life, look at liberty, and look at what happens to us on the ground. That's my spiel this morning. And I had good help from Comfort Johnson, my research assistant, which I could not have done this without her. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. And thank you, David. Thank you, Brenda, and thank you, Comfort. Um, so I, I wanna give the panelists a chance to um, comment or question each other before I, uh, I, I throw off a question of my own or bring in questions from the audience. Um, any panelists want to uh, want to chime in at this point for, for a conversation with the others? All right. So, um, well, if you think of something, uh, uh, you've got a moment or two to do it. I, I want to go back um, to uh, Commissioner Broussard's comments uh, this morning and tie them into a couple of the things that I heard uh, on this panel. Um, I, I, I was struck by her statement that um, the FEC uh, concluded that business considerations are what lies behind the platforms decisions uh, with regard to moderation and that um, um, therefore the FEC uh, doesn't have the authority to, um, to regulate in that space. And as a matter of, of statutory authority uh, for the FEC, I think that's exactly right. And I think that's probably descriptively correct that um, based on the information we know today that uh, social media platforms are engaging in moderation platforms in ways that they think advance their business objectives. Um, and I want to tie that to, uh, to Robert, a statement that you made about how uh, maybe this, this, this uh, title for this um, uh, panel uh, implies that we see platforms as a, as a solution to the problem and your point that they are um, uh, creating or exacerbating the problem. And, and Jasmine, your statement that, um, that this is really through design decisions. So um, if we wash our hands of the political problems here because they're simply engaged in good business and increasing their bottom line, um, are we missing the point that their um, bottom line, the attention economy, uh, the surveillance economy uh, is built on the very idea of engaging people and what is engaging to people tends to be things that make them angry and emotional and, um, and that, that is leading to the kinds of content, uh, the, proliferate, the, the creation and proliferation of misinformation. It, and, and if that's true, how do we think about and address the underlying business model of platforms in a way that, um, that might uh, break that chain? Anyone have any thoughts on, on that? So if I can, um, we regulate business models all the time, right? So a business model is not sacrosanct in the American economy. And in fact, what has happened is because we have taken a hands-off approach, this has allowed 
outside entities like Russia to come in and use their weapons, right? Their weapon is there's no regulation here. Wild Wild West, they can do what they do, right? But back to we regulate all the time. We regulate, right? You can regulate, you know, an obscene house based on secondary effects, okay? You can do time, place, and you can do things. The court, in its willingness to reach out on an intermediate scrutiny level, can do certain things and regulate certain business. We regulate medical devices, right? We don't let you put a pacemaker out there on the market and say, okay, boys, go in there and whoever gets the best one, they do. The ISP, P's are business models. They are not just friends of us. They are business models. They make their money through advertisement. So the, as soon as we, when I say we, not, not the FCC, but collectively, collectively, we begin making these arguments in court. We begin teaching this. We begin writing about this. As soon as we recognize that, then we can come up with solutions. But as long as we are not, right? As long as we're saying, no, we can't do anything, then we, then we won't do anything. And that's, you know, that's my take about everything, right? You have to first start pushing the envelope and drilling down and saying, no, nah, this isn't quite true. My take. Ema? Yeah, I mean, so I think there were, there were a lot of things packed in, in, into your question. I think that in some ways the, the conversation is more complex if we think about incentives of platforms, right? Um, there's certainly, I think, a lot that's been written about sort of the attention aspect of things, right? And, and maybe a desire in, in design to sort of push that attention. I also think pushing on the other side is sort of a reality that um, if people don't have a good experience on platforms or they don't have trust on those platforms, they won't use them. Right. And so I think where you get sort of the business incentive and I think what drives some of the work around, you know, harassment, content moderation, et cetera, is also sort of that that business interest. And I think that's why you're seeing sort of a greater, greater conversations in, in industry around things like health and online health and, and platforms. Um, and so I, I sort of cabin that to say, I, I think we're having a, a more complex conversation if we're talking about what the business incentives are and how we change those incentives. Um, having said that, I think that, you know, one of the things that it really, I think, an area where I think we, we need more scholarship on and certainly more conversation on is this question around algorithms, responsible ML, et cetera, right? So how do these things actually work? Um, how do we have some level of explainability and transparency so that we even understand how they work and we can assess whether um, they're operating as intended? Are they creating harms? Are there better ways? Um, that these that these platforms can actually operate. Um, but I also say that recognizing, I think at a practical level, content moderation is difficult for all of the reasons the panelists have outlined in terms of shades of gray. But at a more even more practical level, it's challenging to do at scale, um, unless you're really gonna sort of encourage platforms to review every piece of content before it goes online. And that will just result in a lot of things not making it online because there's not enough capacity. It'll also potentially result in what I think we need, which is more entrance to the market, newer entrance to the market who have newer ideas, innovative ideas, it can provide a barrier, potentially an economic barrier um, that prevents that. And so I, all of that is to say, I think we need to sort of think about the incentives more broadly, think about how we encourage more market actors, right? And then also think about algorithms and machine learning. So those new actors and existing actors um, you know, we're, we're pressing them to sort of be more responsible or at least for society writ large to be able to assess what's happening and, and devise solutions that really make sense. Yeah, and, that, and that's, um, you know, part of the impetus for the creation of Section 230 in uh, 1996 was to create a, a, a ecosystem where there could be competition among internet service providers around their moderation policies. The idea was provide this protection so that they can experiment, so that they can create a niche within the market uh, in terms of how they moderate content in order to attract users. And through that, the market itself would serve this function of, uh, of accountability, essentially. Um, but yet we, we don't have in many of the social media spaces that degree of competition today that um, allows users to make those choices because there simply isn't an alternative. Um, I, I, related to Section 230, I want to make sure that, that we're clear that, um, that even if we removed Section 230 immunity from platforms, 
um, that doesn't remove the First Amendment's limitations on the government's ability to punish these types of speech. A lot of people pointed it's Section 230's problem. Uh, if we got rid of Section 230, all of this misinformation would go away. But as we heard in the first panel this morning, um, in fact, the, the, a lot of categories of, um, of false campaign speech that we're worried about simply aren't uh, amenable to government regulation because of existing First Amendment doctrine. So. Um, uh, we, we need to be aware that just removing Section 230 isn't going to be a magic wand and, and, and make everything go away. But that ties me into a question that um, uh, Professor um, uh, Hasten sent, which is um, uh, it's directed to you, Ms. Uh, Guliani, um, but I think everyone can, can perhaps chime in on this. Would a law, law barring false election speech that makes it a crime, for example, to um, uh, about where, when, where, or how people vote, which I think we can take from the first panel, maybe an area where the first amendment would permit the government, where it's where it's um, uh, deceiving voters in a in a in a tangible and clearly uh, creating a harm around uh, their choices and in, 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 in whether they can vote and how they vote. Um, if that um, uh, uh, law were to be applied to platforms, in other words, we 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 take a law we passes First Amendment scrutiny, and we exempt that liability under Section 230 and, and, and allow platforms to be held responsible for um, distributing that kinds of speech. Um, would that kind of uh, narrow law uh, against empirically verifiable facts um, create dangers in other countries? Do you think that that's a, 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 a good idea, a good place to start? Um, so I, I can chime in quickly. I mean, I think there's sort of two components um, of that proposal that are important to think about. One is kind of mens rea, right? What kind of intent are we talking about? Are we talking about a situation where a platform may have been invested, you know, millions in content moderation, but they're just not able to, to content moderate at scale in an effective way? So I certainly think having a, a mens rea where there's no intent requirement is complex um, and creates challenges. Um, I guess the second thing I would say is if there's not sort of that mens rea requirement and we're enforcing this against platforms that host content, um, we'd wanna think about what are the, the economic consequences of that? And is that really at a practical level are platforms gonna say, look, I'm just not gonna have election speech on, on my platform, right? It's too much a liability. I can't content moderate at scale. I don't have the money to do it. I'm a smaller platform or even I'm a, a bigger platform that just doesn't wanna take on that risk. And so I, I worry a little bit about sort of the secondary economic consequences when we're not at a place where there's actually malintent or even you know gross negligence or, or something of, of that nature, um, especially in parts of the world where you know I think people at a practical level are far more reliant on Facebook um, online platforms as a way of having political conversations because they don't necessarily have um, a robust media or they don't have other places where those conversations can happen in a safe way. I'll throw it up to the other panelists on that on that theme. Are there um, uh, approaches that you think um, the platforms can uh, can take in this space that would um, one comport with the First Amendment, but also be effective in um, in dealing with some of the misinformation problems we've been talking about? Again, this is where I you know I don't really come at this from a law and technology side. So, you know, I I have heard a lot of suggestions that as essentially a layperson on this sound reasonable. And I, and I actually would love to hear from someone who might be at a platform, what the feasibility or not is. But, you know, one of the major problems is just the, um, the velocity at which misinformation can spread. And so I've heard suggestions, for example, that there might be ways to just limit the number of, um, uh, of reshares, for example, um, and that that might go some way. Um, and then, you know, to the extent that you're able to come up with solutions that are not content based, um, but that are uh, focused on the identity of actors that might have focuses uh, that might focus on um, on anonymous uh, speech, um, that those might be avenues to um, reduce harms while avoiding at least some of the more difficult line drawing problems. Um, but again, I, I really do consider myself more, more of a novice when we get into the weeds of particular solutions. Brenda, I saw your, uh, your, your hand go up or you, you unmuted for a moment. Did you wanna add something on that? You're muted at the moment. So 
So the question was directed toward voting, and the question was directed toward misinformation in voting, which is part of the Voting Rights Act. You cannot ask internet regulation to take care of something that is a part and parcel of a fundamental liberty in the democracy. And if you are talking about safeguarding this republic's attempts at democracy as opposed to attempts at overthrowing the democracy, you cannot use this area, I don't think, to deal with and address a societal problem, which is voting and access to voting. You have an access to the internet, but you also have an access to voting. So if you try to get that law, you put that in and say, okay, you can't get misinformation and disinformation on that. Bad actors find a way to circumvent and, fall and, and, and come around that. Oh, okay, we can't do that, but no, you can't do absentee ballots. We can do that. That's within state right, states' rights because absentee ballots lead to fraud, which is not true. So trying to create laws to stay one step ahead of technology, in this case, internet, just doesn't work. You know, as a person that teaches IP, courts are never up to speed on intellectual property. So if we keep treating this, the First Amendment, as sacrosanct over every other fundamental liberty, then we are not going to address voting in this space. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Everybody is going to run around, scratch their heads, and say, we can't do it. And it's the same thing with the Supreme Court, right? We've got to protect First Amendment, and we are going to create this law, but it's going to be content-based, right? This content-based, because if you're talking about voting, why are you saying the person can't give false information about voting, but they could give false information about drinking polluted water? You're going to run, I think, into a problem. That's just me. But I don't have a solution either. So, you know. Well, we're, we're, we have uh, about a minute left, so uh, I'm going to let uh, Nima go last and give us the solution, and then we can all walk away and know that, uh, <laughs> that we're, that we're going to do the right thing here. Go ahead, Nima. I mean, with just such short time, I, I hate to dive into that solution and we all have to go. I mean, no, I mean, I think that the concerns people are raising um, are right. And, you know, I go back to, I think, you know, when we talked about reference to the Voting Rights Act, right, and, and broader solutions that we need, I'm certainly in favor of that. I think those things have stalled federally. We're seeing sort of some action, some good, some bad at the state level. But I think what underpins um, the Voting Rights Act and a lot of the laws we have on the books is that question of intent, right? And that I think is where is really important if we're thinking about the secondary speech consequences of intent neutral type of penalties um, that might fall in this area. And I think that's also where sort of some of the First Amendment um, equities are, are most at play. So that's my solution. I don't I know it's not a very good one, um, but I'm sure we'll have more conversations. Great. Well, I want to thank all of the panelists, and, and I'm, I know we went a little bit long, and I apologize for uh, for keeping you all stuck in front of your screens. Um, this is a topic where I think we could have spent we could spend the rest of the day talking about it, and probably at the end of that conversation, feel like we haven't really provided any further answers at all. Um, I want to welcome. I want to bring Elizabeth back, um, the EIC of the First Amendment Law Review, and uh, and let her um, uh, send us home. Or, or, or send us off, I guess, because we're most of us are already home. Thank you, Professor Ardia and all of our panelists. Um, I hope attendees, participants, everyone, I hope you all enjoyed today as much as I have. Um, I just want to briefly say a few more thank yous on behalf of all of Fowler. Um, first of all, to our symposium editor, Madeline Geis. Um, as EIC, a lot of my job is keeping track of a lot of different projects and pulling different strings and a lot of different people. And so having rock star editors like Maddie working under me really makes my job easier. So I'll just reiterate everything that Professor Ardia has, has said already about the work that she did on this event. To Professors Ardia and Papandrea, who in addition to being moderators today, um, serve as our, our faculty advisor and symposium advisor respectively, Thank you so much. They have guided us through this whole process of planning this event and so much more. Um, and so we really appreciate them. And our other moderator, Professor Muller, who had to jump in at the last minute um, to help out a, a colleague who had a family emergency and did so uh, so well and with, so graciously. We really appreciate that. Um, and again, as, as Professor Ardia mentioned, Charles Story, 
our tech wizard behind the scenes. We really cannot thank you enough uh, for all the work that you've put into this and how much you've helped us. Um, and, and finally, to all our, our speakers and panelists, um, you know, a couple of people mentioned, touched on today, uh, how we have kind of gotten into our bubbles, um, sometimes due to social media um, and sort of what we're, what's being put in front of us there or for a variety of other reasons. But I just, I truly think it's more important than ever that we're able to come together and have these conversations um, on these really important topics uh, among people with a lot of different uh, perspectives and viewpoints. And so thank you all for such wonderful and robust discussion today. Um, and finally, to, to everyone who attended today, um, again, I hope you all enjoyed today as much as I have and encourage you to stay in touch, follow First Amendment Law Review on Twitter um, and keep an eye out for our symposium issue, um, which will be coming out in a couple months and include some research from some of these panelists um, and that we're excited to share with all of you. So with that, I will turn it back over to Maddie to uh, run through some last minute logistical announcements and send you all on your way. Thanks, Elizabeth, and reiterating absolutely everything you just said. Thank you to everyone who played a part in today, who came today. Um, though we were virtual, I think it was an incredible event. Um, so thank you to all of you. Um, I know that I forgot again to mention the CLE term at the beginning of panel three. Um, but the two terms you need for panel three for those of you with the CLE worksheet are Twitter and then Facebook. And I'll just quickly run through all of the terms for the CLE worksheet one more time. For keynote speaker, you should have First Amendment and then Chapel Hill. For panel one, you should have election misinformation and then Citizens United. For panel two, you should have political ads and then micro-targeting. And for panel three, you should have Twitter and then Facebook. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, follow First Amendment Law Review on Twitter. Um, keep an eye on our website. That is where uh, we will post links to this symposium. Um, and its recordings will go up on the Center for Media Law and Policies Vimeo page, as well as the law school's YouTube page. Um, I'm sure that we'll post links to both of those on the First Amendment Law Review's website um, and keep an eye out for our symposium edition as well. Um, thank you to all of you. You are free to go. Um, that concludes our 2022 symposium. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Maddie.